Okay, it's seven. Uh, I'm going to give our board one more minute to join. Okay, well, we have a quorum, so let's get started. Uh, I'm going to call the meeting to order at 7.01. So, good evening, everyone. I'm Janet Evans, Chair of the CA Board of Directors. Please remember that this meeting of the CA Board is being live streamed. You can find tonight's agenda on the Board's webpage uh, on the CA website, or there are also links to the documents if you are viewing this via YouTube. If you are virtual, well, as we all are tonight, thank you, COVID, uh, please mute your mics unless you're speaking. Please raise your hand to speak, and I will record names in the order in which I see them. And as always, I'm grateful if anyone helps me monitor chat in case I'm missing anyone. As we move through the meeting, I will introduce each item on the agenda. Uh, before a vote is taken, I will restate a motion as well as who motioned and who seconded. If at any point you have trouble hearing me or any other board member, please say so. Um, our timekeeper tonight is Sherry, but I'm not seeing her yet, so it'll be me for the time being. <laughs> so now I will call roll. Oh, and Jess let me know that she will be running late tonight, so she will join us as soon as she can. Oh, there's Sherry. Hey, Sherry, are you ready to be timekeeper tonight? Were you aware that you're timekeeper tonight? Yes. Okay. I just wanted to make sure. I didn't want to spring it on you if you weren't ready. <laughs> yeah, just let me. Um... Well, I'm just about to take roll, so you don't have to start timing anything yet. But Okay. Okay. Andy. Present. Sherry. Present. Jenny. Present. Dick. You're muted, but I see you. Lynn. Here. Tina. Here. Eric. Here. Ashley. Here. Lakey. Here. And me, I'm here. Okay. I have a number of closed meetings. Okay, so uh, closed meetings that have been held, meeting of the Board of Directors, December 9th, for the Risk Management Committee held at CA headquarters. Present were Lakey Boyd, Tina Horn, Jess Duvall, Ashley Vaughn, and Susan Krabby. Vote to close 540 against. Time closed 630. <clears throat> closed with, uh, according to meetings of homeowners associations or its governing body, consultation with staff personnel, consultants, attorneys board members or other persons in connection with pending or potential litigation or other legal matters to review the status of general liability insurance and the meeting, the closed meeting ended at 6.59 p.m. There was a closed meeting of the board of directors on December 13th for the architectural residential committee Meeting closed at 1.03 p.m. Present were Wes, Aniton, Deb Bach, Devorah Wilkinson, Susan Sloan, Ed Gordon. Vote to close was four in favor, zero against, and it was discussion, discussion of new and ongoing covenant cases and closed under 
Section four, consultation with staff, personnel, consultants, attorneys, or other persons in connection with pending or potential litigation. Meeting ended at 2.20 p.m. There was a closed meeting of, uh, let's see, also the Architectural Residential Committee on January 10th. Meeting started at 1.02 p.m. Present were Wes Aniton, Deb Bach, Devorah Wilkinson, Susan Sloan. Vote to close was three in favor, zero against. Discussion of new and ongoing covenant cases under closed under HOA section four. Consultation with staff, personnel, consultants, attorneys, or other persons in connection with pending or potential potential litigation. Meeting ended at 1:50 p.m. Closed meeting of board of directors on January 13th. Present were Dick Bolton, Lakey Boy, Jess Duvall, Lynn Egan, Janet Evans, Eric Greenberg, Tina Horn, Andy Stack, Ginny Thomas, Ashley Vaughn, and Sherry Zaret. Vote to close was seven in favor, three against. Uh, it started at 10 p.m. It was closed under the Maryland Homeowners Association Act Section 4. Consultation with staff personnel, consultants, attorneys, board, oh wait, separate, oh, sorry. Section one, discussions of matters pertaining to employees and personnel. The purpose of the meeting was to discuss and vote on matters pertaining to personnel. Time, the, the closed meeting ended at 11.30 p.m. And that is all I have for closed meetings. Um, okay, can I have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Ginny moves. Do I have a second? Lynn second. Tina second. <laughs> Lynn beat you to it, Tina. Uh, Ginny moves. Lynn seconds. Do I have any objections to tonight's agenda? Okay. Unanimous. Thank you. Okay. Next up, we have resident speak out. I'll just remind all the uh, speakers. Janet, Janet, excuse me. I had my mute button on. Uh, I'm opposed to the agenda. You're opposed to the agenda. Okay. Uh, no, just join the meeting, 707. Welcome, Jess. Uh, Tina, you had a question? Or did you accidentally raise your hand? Okay. <laughs> uh, moving on to residents speak out, I'll just remind everyone that residents have three minutes, organizations have five minutes. Uh, Sherry will be our timekeeper tonight, and uh, Ryan, I have you in the queue. Did you have a question around the uh, process? No, sorry, I just thought we were maybe supposed to uh, raise our hand. Oh no, I just I thought maybe you had a a time crunch and you needed to go sooner. <laughs> sure, Sherry's the timekeeper tonight. Yeah, Sherry's the timekeeper. Yeah. All right. Um, all right, so first up, we have Mary Kay Sigety talking about Columbia Festival of the Arts. Welcome, Mary Kay. Thank you, Janet. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm here tonight because 35 years ago, we began the Columbia Festival of the Arts. We began it at the lakefront, and we began it with CA's help and cooperation. And it's been a 34, this will be the 35th year collaboration over time. As you know, the last two years, we haven't been able to do our Lake Fest because of COVID. And in the last two years, we did not come to you and ask you for assistance, well, because we couldn't do it. This year, we expect to come back full force to bring back to the community an event that spans Friday, Saturday and Sunday, and brings um, a multitude or, or a plethora or a gaggle or whatever, whatever collective noun we want to use of um, visual arts, performing arts, and um, from diverse areas of our, of our culture 
the cultures that we have that that are in colombia with us we have we will be having artists from africa performing will be having i'm told we'll be having latin american artists performing we will also be having some of our homegrown talent performing so we're back to support the arts and to also create for the community that wonderful free um experience that we've come to love so 35 years ago you all stepped up to help us and i'm hoping that in our 35th year you will also step up to continue to help us um we have we know that it it that presenting quality arts always takes time effort dollars and people and um so the we have um enjoyed your support as i have said before and in the last um i can't i don't know how many years and i'm remiss in that you have um given us financial support in the realm of a hundred thousand dollars we know that it takes over four hundred thousand dollars to produce this particular event and we have many partners but ca has always been a um an important partner with us and we feel as though what we do is a shared value with what you do right it is it we work hard to bring quality to the community to enrich people's lives to provide the free opportunities um for engagement this particular weekend that we have planned coming up is i well i'm very excited about it as i told you we have artists from a um, variety of, of different areas but my favorite that's coming and i don't know if you saw this a few years ago we had a, a group from um australia called strange fruit <laughs> and they did ballet in the in the sky on poles and they are going to be coming back to again um and they will be performing each of our days and they will be engaging with the community we're going to be doing workshops for families and for kids with them and they are going to be our you know our big um unusual event and for me personally as a visual artist yes they are a performing arts but they're also visual arts um and uh exciting we'll also be bringing back our marketplace where um artists from our community will have a chance to engage and to um sell their work and show what's going on we are we are so excited because we've been in for so long the idea that we can that we can bring back is um is truly exciting for us thank you i'm going to yep 30, i'm going to stop seconds, there if you can wrap thank you okay you're welcome sherry did i go five minutes okay great i'm done <laughs> Time Thank flies. We're having fun. Uh, we have a question right. from Tina. Hi, Tina. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Kay. I appreciate your 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 advocacy very very much. Do you have the dates for us? Yes, I do. See, I knew I was going to forget something. I have to admit, I'm sitting in my pickup truck in Florida, so I've got notes and. Um, like you do. Uh, it and is June. It's going to be June 10, 11, and 12. Would you be can I ask another question? I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Um go ahead, if Tina. you if you know it and can get it easily, would you be willing to send us a, a list perhaps of the last two or three years or for COVID, um, what CA has been able to sponsor or provide support for? I would value yes, seeing that very, very much. Absolutely. We have that we have that um that record over time. Yes. So I will yeah. Great. Yes. Uh so Tina asked part of my question already. No surprise. Mm -hmm. Um the, the other part is what is the specific request 
um, from Columbia Association and how we could support the Columbia Festival of the Arts for this year. We are asking you, if you could, to support us at the financial level of $100,000. Um, Got it. That, okay. that is indeed um, commensurate with what you, we, you were supporting us with before. But yes, Tina, I will get your, I'll get the specific numbers to you. Um, Janet, who do I best set, have that sent to? Uh, you're welcome to send that to me, to Lakey, you know, pretty much anyone okay. on the board. <laughs> All right, that's fine. I just wanted to, I just wanted to check because I'm going to be calling um, our executive uh, director and asking him to. Um, put that together and then get it over to you. Okay, Tina, last one. Or to the board email address was something I was going to suggest. Okay, whatever. Then we don't have it. Yep. yep. Thank you, Mary Kay. All righty. Thanks a bunch, everybody. Have some Good fun tonight. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. Bye. All right, next up we have Richard Briggs. Richard, are you with us? Okay, I don't see Richard, so we'll come back to him. Uh, Amy Bennett, protect our stream long reach. Amy, are you on? Uh, you're still muted. Uh, let's see. Do you see the mute button on your uh, device? Uh, we can't hear you, Amy, so uh, let's try to troubleshoot here. Um, yeah, if you single tap on the- There we go. There we go. Excellent. Sorry about that. That's all right, welcome. Thank you. Um, good evening, my name is Amy Bennett. I'm a 33-year 30, 30, resident of Long Reach and a 55-year resident of Columbia. I'm here to talk about the Lake Elkhorn Stream Mitigation Project, specifically focused on comments received by the Army Corps of Engineers and the MDE from the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, the Sierra Club of Maryland, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and the Patuxent River Keepers. I'm asking the board to consider whether the comments raised by these organizations have merit, and if so, how they can be addressed. Before, be, uh, before I begin, uh, in order not to interpret for you what was said, I will be reading their official comments into the record. I am starting tonight uh, with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. I acknowledge up front that I am not reading the entire letters and strongly encourage you to do so. I have not cherry picked comments. Before I begin reading, I want you to be aware that three Maryland senators, one delegate and three county council members had, have submitted comments on the proposal asking for a denial, extension and or further information. I will now read major parts of the Chesapeake Bay Foundation letter. I'm just gonna show you, I'm reading directly from their letter, their, their letterhead to Jack, Danae and Kelly Neff. Um, I'm skipping the beginning part, which deals with regulatory stuff. So here we go, starting with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. While the intent of the project is laudable, the project's perspective fails to show that establishment of a Lake Elkhorn compensatory mitigation bank will fulfill the stated goals and objectives. Specifically, the project fails, quote, to establish a framework for restoring, enhancing, creating, and or preserving tidal and non-tidal wetlands, riparian systems, streams, and contiguous buffer cor corridors, as well as other uh, aquatic resources. That's from the perspective. The Lake Elkhorn proposal cannot meet th these goals for several reasons, primarily because any restoration and preservation efforts in the stream will likely be overwhelmed by pollution caused by extensive untreated, impervious surfaces that channels polluted runoff towards the area intended for restoration. Uh, the the um, proposal or the comments are organized according to four things. The first concern is the Lake Alcorn 
proposal fails to show it will provide high function and value based on a watershed approach. In fact, the proposal ignores the root cause of erosion within the watershed. Again, I remind you, these are not my comments. These are the comments of the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. During a recent site visit, C CBF staff observed firsthand that there is a lack of effective stormwater management throughout the Lake Elkhorn watershed. Stormwater management that does not properly slow and filter polluted runoff is the overarching cause of erosion and instability of the Lake Elkhorn stream system. The Chesapeake Bay Foundation land restoration specialist walked along a trail which followed and crossed the streams numerous times. The stormwater runoff from the upstream segments will be aggravated by the increasing amount, frequency, and severe severity of rainfall from climate change will potentially over rain, overwhelm restoration work by the flooding area. Can I have 30 seconds? Will you tell me, will you tell me when I have 30 seconds left, please? Um, Lake Elkhorn's upstream hydrology is an essential consideration. Without accounting for the stormwater volume and quality throughout the stream's watershed, the mitigation that occurs as a result of the proposal is likely to be ineffective at increasing the functionality of the existing stream. Chesapeake Bay Foundation senior scientists attended meetings held by Columbia Association with residents. This project is an opportunity for the Columbia Association to take a comprehensive approach to stream mitigation that would incorporate upland stormwater management to help support the success of in-stream quality enhancement. The Columbia Association should consider the full impact of impervious surfaces, stormwater volumes, and associated stream impacts, and the Corps of Engineers and the MDE should not allow in-stream work until upland st stormwater sources are addressed. Second issue of concern. The applicant fails to show that the proposal will restore and preserve aquatic and semi-aquatic resources and fails to show relative probability of successfully achieving self-maintaining ecological uplift. The suggestion that this project will result in restoration, preservation, and ecological uplift can only be considered in the context of the destructive impacts associated with the mitigation work. A mitigation proposal should not include destructive impacts to existing wetland stream channels or if you can rate. if you can wrap up now and summarize please thank you yes thank you for the heads up so um i will tell you there are uh two additional um large uh issues raised by um cbf i want to read you the recommendation based on the comments above cbf does not support issuance of the permits for this mitigation product bank in its current form and shares the concerns of local residents who treasure the Lake Elkhorn watershed in its current condition, even if upgraded. There are significant improvements that can be made to the system through better upland stormwater management and recreational facility management that would not authorize the destruction of wetlands elsewhere in the identified service area. And I just want to um, take one second to say how fabulous the webinar last night was on climate change and its impact on Columbia. That's the kind of work that Columbia normally does. It's thorough, it uses the best experts, and it involves the community. I thank you for your time. Please read those four documents. We'll be back in two weeks to read another one. Thank you so very, very much. You're muted, Janet. Oops. Thank you, Amy. We have a question from Dick Bolton. Actually, this is a question from Lakey. Uh, we've gotten a number of letters on this and some reports and things. And uh, I guess it was over a month ago, I sent a note to you and to John McCoy, because uh, I don't know a thing about this, trying to get some kind of a, a response so we uh, have a better idea of you know, just what what John in particular thinks about this. Um, never got a response. Uh, I really would appreciate it if you and John would get back to the board, yes. review the various papers that we've been sent. Dick, do you have a question? We, yes, and I'm and I'm just asking Lakey to, to take care of that. Thank you. Uh, so I would like to respond that I did send an email response. Um, so I, I do think that's important to state. Um, 
I, I would like a little more clarity on what the board would like as information. Certainly I can work with staff to do that. Uh, I just like to you know, get a, an opinion of the papers that are being sent in. The, the gist of it seems to be that we get a lot of water being fire hosed into our wetlands and no matter what we do to repair the, the, that drainage area, it's just all going to be washed out. So I'd like, to, I'd like to know if that's true or not. I, I, I certainly don't know. I'm looking for an expert opinion. Uh, Sherry? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm very um, interested in um, this aspect of, um, of what we do and then what other parts of the county do and what other parts of the region do. Yep. Well, if I'm understanding um, what you're reporting back, um, it sounds like something that would need to be negotiated with um, with the county and with the state. That's right. Um, and I, I guess um, I guess my other question is, from the response that you've gotten. Um, do projects have to be done further upstream before this can be initiated, or can things be done co-jointly? Yeah, Amy. Um, am I unmuted? You are, yes. Okay. Um, I guess, uh, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. So do the projects, so the the stormwater management uh, and the stream restoration, could they be done simultaneously? Um, okay, uh, I'm, I'm gonna pass on that uh, question, kind of. The, um, the uh, US Co uh, Army Corps and the MDE have extended the comment period twice on this initiative because of the amount of comments that have been received. And, um, in fact, I was encouraged by the MDE person to um, speak directly with you guys um, to try and get you to understand at least um, some of the concerns that residents in the community have. And um, they were validated by these four reports that I keep referencing. So I know that um, when you initially um, approved this project, you were given very little information. And basically what you were told was this, this is all gonna fix everything that's wrong in the stream. That's just simply not the case. And you and I know, you, all of us know, free money is never free. And what's going to happen following this, according to these documents, not according to Amy Bennett, according to the documents, we are setting ourselves up for extensive problems, both immediately and long term. My house is right on the. Uh, oh, the. Uh, Amy, so, Amy, we're gonna have to take the next question. Okay, but just let me say there are three phases to the project. Somebody asked about that, and so um, they are proposing to start phase one. Well, that's what they're, but that's what the perspective will be. It will be on the project starting with phase one. Eric. Uh, did we lose Eric? Eric, are you with right. us? I, I oh, okay. Sorry. Sorry. Um, the, the question I have is, is there an alternate proposal to uh, conduct the restoration uh, of these, of the stream, or are you proposing to not do any uh, restoration work on, on this particular wetland? Is that to me? Yeah. Um, no. Uh, uh, the... Um, the department has already asked for a revised proposal based on the comments that were received. Um, I don't know this, I don't know what CA's involvement is in this next 30 days. The comment period now ends on February 23rd. I think that Dick asked the right question, which is what is CA's response to the, to the comments that have been raised by four significant environmental organizations? I think that's fair. Any further questions for Amy? 
Thank you, Amy. Thank you. Have a good evening. You too. Okay, next up, and Michael, I'm going to apologize ahead of time. Michael uh, Golubazuk from the Owen Brown Community Association. Yep. Hi, it's uh, Michael Liebersuch, uh, representing Owen Brown. Thank you. We, uh, we sent a letter to CA just, I think, yesterday covering a lot of topics uh, about the, the budget. Um, I just wanted to highlight a, a few points, and thanks for the opportunity to do so in the more transparent process this year. Uh, first point we wanted to highlight is that the budget continues a longstanding practice of investing unequally in the village associations. So the draft budget proposes an operational grant for Owen Brown that equals about $30 per resident, $30.04. On the other hand, the draft budget provides almost $50 per resident for Wild Lake and Town Center. If Owen Brown were being funded at the same rate per capita as those villages, our grant would be hundreds of thousands of dollars larger. We understand the grants are determined by a formula that was selected several years ago. That formula is part of the problem. It is regressive by design and provides larger grants to some villages simply because CA invested more capital money in those villages in the past. Conversely, the formula dictates smaller grants for other villages because CA did not invest as much capital money and they don't have the same facility space. Additionally, the capital investments in this year's budget also highlight the inequity between villages. Long Reach and Town Center will each receive more capital investment in this budget year than Owen Brown has received in the last 10 years. Please don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that I'm opposed to, you know, fixing their, the community centers there, just highlighting that it's a very big discrepancy. So there's a lot of aspects about the way CA resources villages that should be examined. Please do that over the next year. We don't expect you to make those adjustments in this budget cycle, but you found hundreds of thousands of dollars laying around for various purposes, whether that's Inner Arbor Trust or maybe the Festival of the Arts and all sorts of other things, you could find some additional money to augment Owen Brown's grant uh, and possibly other villages that are under-resourced as well. The, the second point I wanted to make uh, is we recommend that CA permanently close two to three outdoor pools. This is often treated as a taboo subject but it's in the best interest of the community. Historic attendance shows that there's more than enough capacity to accommodate everyone who wants to visit a pool in the summer. And some of the pools that are open receive an extremely small number of attendees. CA should not be spending hundreds of thousands of dollars each year to open pools that only a handful of residents use. There's a lot of other ways to invest that money that would serve those same residents even better. Uh, and then finally, just wanted to highlight that it's really not always clear. I, I appreciate what Lakey said in our transmittal letter, how budgets are, uh, they, they show what your values are, but it's really not clear how this budget aligns with the stated goals that are right at the beginning of the, the document put out. For example, the second strategic priority, which is resource stewardship, it, that should be inseparable from the budget process, but it's really not clear if and how all the systems and scorecards listed as supporting goals to resource stewardship played a role in developing this draft budget. So we think it's really critical uh, that CA de develop an objective way to evaluate the value of the amenities and services it's providing in order to help drive its budget decisions so that you, we understand that you know, this money is providing this value to this number of people. Um, like I said, we sent a letter, has, has many other topics, you know, some of which is not really Owen Brown's business, but just as members of the community, we provided input on a lot of stuff. Uh, we hope you read it. And that's it. Thanks for hearing me out. Thank you, Michael. Do we have any questions? Thank you for your letter. I appreciate it. Yeah, I was going to say, we always appreciate getting stuff in writing, so thank you. Okay, next up we have Christine Amari. Is Christine on the line? Oh, yeah, I see her. Christine, are you with us? Yes, I'm sorry. I'm right here. Hi, uh, good evening and thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, I live in Hickory Ridge and I'm on the Hickory Ridge Village Board. 
Um, I believe Laura, the village manager, is going to speak on behalf of the board a little bit later, so I'm just speaking as a resident tonight. Um, the budget issue I would like to specifically address tonight is funding for replacing the six pence tot lot. Um, it's been very sad to have this tot lot closed throughout the pandemic. Prior to the closure, this tot lot was a real hub of the community. Um, it sits in a very nice shady area near the river along the walking paths. Um, I live by the tot lot and I would almost always see people using it after school when many families were walking home. It was a very popular time uh, with many kids there. And it, it always seemed to be busy um, at other times too, on weekends, in the mornings, even on weekdays. Um, I would just always see people there. Uh, my own children were lucky enough to have the playground for many years um, growing up, and we uh, connected with many other families there, making long-term friendships between uh, both the kids and the adults alike. Um, I've talked to many families there who would travel to use this playground because it was so nice, um, and it's one of the few playgrounds that accommodates older children as well as younger, which I definitely believe is a huge draw and adds a lot, and it's very valuable for the older age range where there are fewer spaces that are sort of designed to serve them. Um, I've talked to uh, so many people about this tot lot, both residents who've lived here for decades and have fond memories of their children playing on it, and also new residents who've been really sad that it's been closed for so long and the children haven't been able to use it. Um, really just so many people love and value this space. Um, I think when the survey was put out um, for replacing the tot lot, 134 people responded to it to help choose a replacement playground structure. And I definitely feel like since it's been closed, um, I've met fewer people and connected with fewer neighbors without this kind of great place to bring us together. Um, and I feel like this is a, a sort of unique and special space in our community with a huge amount of history uh, that has benefited, benefited so many people and facilitated so many connections between neighbors and residents. And I would really like to see that continue uh, to serve in that capacity for many years to come. So thanks for your time and consideration tonight, and I hope that you'll consider um, making the investment in the tot lot and, and allocating funds in the budget for a replacement to the current structure that you know continues to serve um, a large uh, range of uh, ages and um, such a such a big segment of the community. Thank you, Christine. Uh, do we have any questions? Okay, we appreciate your input tonight. Thank you, have a good night. Thank you, you too. Okay, next up we have Laura Parrish from the Hickory Ridge Community Association. Hi, good evening everyone. Um, I'm the village manager for Hickory Ridge and I'm here to advocate for funding in the FY23 capital budget for the replacement of the current six pence tot lot um, play structure um, and replacing it with the twin towers play structure that was proposed by CA staff. Um, just a little background, Christine gave a nice warm fuzzy about neighborhood use. I'm more like, here's what's going on. Um, the six pence tot lot play structure was originally, originally constructed in 1978. Um, the design was only, only one of its kind in Columbia. The original plan included a special wobbly bridge and fort structure built around an existing tree. And it was designed by Fred Jarvis, who happened to live in the village for many years. Um, he was a landscape ar architect and community planner and de designed golf courses and waterfront communities and things. So he was pretty well known. Um, the tot lot has been a destination location for area children for years. In 2013, because the original tot lot was deteriorating, the tot lot was rebuilt and redesigned, but they kept as much of the style and character of the previous design as possible. So today, Due to the deterioration of the pressure treated lumber used to build the structure, the six pence tot lot has been in disrepair and closed for at least two years. Um, this tot lot is a highly used tot lot in the village, both by neighbors and Clemens Crossing elementary school families. Clemens Crossing is right down the path from the um, tot lot. In June, CA staff presented three options to replace the current closed place structure. Um, the village surveyed the residents. The residents overwhelmingly prefer the Twin Towers play structure option. While this option is more costly than the other two options presented, this structure does more closely resemble the style of the existing one. Also, while most hot lots are primarily intended for two to five year olds, the Skispence hot lot was suitable for, as it existed, was suitable for children to play on up to 10 years old. Um, the results of the survey showed that residents prefer, prefer the Twin Towers structure because it can accommodate more children and also is suitable for a wider age range. 
So we're just asking that funding be allocated in FY23 capital budget for the Twin Towers place structure at the six fence tot lot. Um, please pr preserve that tot lot as a destination for area children as it has been for years. Thank you. Do we have any questions for Laura? Sherry? Uh, yeah. Hi, Laura. Hi, Sherry. <laughs> Hi, nice, nice to see you. Nice to see you. Um, yeah, I just have a, a question about the, um, you said it was rebuilt in 2013. Um, so was that basically um, replacing um, what had been there? Very closely. It wasn't exactly what had been there before, but they did retain the sports structure and a wobbly bridge kind of structure that were important in the original design um, by Mr. Jarvis. So it was altered slightly, but it was a similar style and size to the original one. Unfortunately, it was constructed with a new pressure treated lumber that's more susceptible to bugs and all that. And it's deteriorated to the point that it needs to be replaced. Okay, and um, and I guess my other question is, uh, do you know how much that cost? In so at the time in June when staff presented the options to us, the um, Twin Towers tot lot proposed structure was $165,000. I'm not sure if it's still that price anymore, but that's what it was in June. And, and do you know what the 2013 rebuild cost, cost was? Mm, I don't know off the top of my head, Sherry. Okay, thank you. Yep. Uh, Jess, did you intend to take your hand down or was that accidental? Yeah, I really was just going to try to clarify if there were any other questions since I was village manager at that time that that 2013 renovation was done. But Laura pretty much said what I was going to say, which is the reason it's deteriorated so quickly is, I don't know if you remember when Dennis gave us the presentation about the whole tot lot policy, that, um, you know, that whatever they've done to change the way they pressure treat the lumber has just it's just rotted so it's it's really unfortunate because we put a lot of time and effort into that rebuild and um we worked with dennis ellis on it um back when he was here and um it's a lovely playground and is like really loved by that community thank you um ashley yeah my questions are probably uh better for dennis is the proposed tot lot, the Twin Towers one, is that within the specs for the new tot lots? Um, no. the material required? It's not. Okay. No. So I see we have 500000 on the budget for tot lot replacement. Is that location included in it? Yes. It is. Okay. But with different materials, so a different layout. So the standard tot lot program that we created was about $80,000 in yesterday's dollars. It's probably right, yeah. a little more in today's dollars, but um, so let's say it's 90. Um, but it's it would be far less, it's about half the cost or so of the Twin Towers option. Okay, because the materials, and it lasts longer because of the materials. It's not the right. one. Right, okay. And then what about the age demographic? Does it still appeal to, to an older uh, target? Yes. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Laura. Oh, thank you. Okay, and last up we have Ryan Gardner. Uh, yep, hello. Um, yeah, I'm Ryan Gardner. Uh, I'm also here to uh, ask you to rebuild the Sixpence Tot Lot with uh, something uh, comparable. So, um, but anyway, Laura did a great job. We'll try and be quick, maybe just add a, a few personal notes um, I guess just to give some examples. So it was, it was, I don't know if it was in construction or it was kind of getting redone when we moved in. Um, but I know it's been here for ages. My old neighbor uh, would tell me he was playing with his grandkids on. He said, I've been playing under this uh, troll under the bridge for 40 years here. That was after it was rebuilt, but he was, you know, he played with his kids there. Um, also, uh, you know, I helped run a, a Cub Scout den and also coach soccer teams. We've had den meetings and um, like, soccer gatherings there. Um, so those, those are some personal notes, but um, as has been noted, it's uh, it's used widely, it's love. Um, and and it, yeah, it was there, you know, it was there when we moved in. Um, so we'd love to see something back um, and, and we like something comparable to what was there. 
Um, I would also have to know, I liked, I liked that the previous structure really blended in. It wasn't like a brightly colored thing. It was kind of like a nice wooden. So uh, I'll, I'll just end there, but thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, do we have any questions? I will just note that six pence tot lot has been well represented on uh, to the board. So thank you for all of your feedback and comments. Clearly it's very beloved by the community. Okay, and that wraps up. Oh, did Richard Briggs join us by any chance? Okay, I just wanted to make sure we gave him a chance. Uh, that wraps up our resident speak out for tonight. Okay, next on the consent agenda is the approval of the minutes from the December 9th meeting. Those meeting, those minutes are approved. So we will move on to a board vote for an extension of the Minority Business Enterprise Program Policy. I can entertain a motion to extend our current policy. Uh, I'll make that motion. Okay, Dick moves. Do I have a second? I'll second. Okay, Andy seconds. Any discussion? Uh, okay, Ashley? Yes, this is for the minority business thing, right? Correct. Yeah, okay. Um, so I sent out an email uh, shortly before our meeting, so board members should have it. Let me pull it up. I want to make sure that I'm not misquoting anything. Um, so Tina, Sherry, and I met to discuss it. Obviously, we were clearly in favor of extending the program. Um, and we wanted to talk about the possibility of making some slight adjustments to it. Um, it now's the right time to have the discussion, right, for those points? Well, I think so, but I, I guess it depends on, on how in, in, uh, involved they are. Uh, so, I mean, what we could do is vote to extend it, and then we can modify it at a future meeting uh, so that people could have some time to process the information that you've sent. Uh, but I'm happy to have you highlight it. I think, I, I mean, if it's if it's fairly straightforward changes, yeah. then we yeah. might be able to incorporate them tonight. Okay. And uh, but they're, if they're very high to... level. Yeah. yeah. So right now, the current goal for Columbia Association is at 12 percent, uh, and we did some looking. Howard County's goal is 20 percent. The Federal Small Business Administration is 23, and Maryland State has 29. So thinking that Howard County is at 20% and we're Columbia, um, we were thinking we should at least be meeting that, if not leading in that goal. So we would like to see staff come up with a proposed timeline of how they could hit 20% and match what Howard County is hitting. So that's really the prime target. And then there's other goals that can be adjusted um, and talked about at a future meeting. Uh, so, okay. Thank you for that. I think the key there is that uh, one, we should allow staff and Lakey time to respond to that request um, so that we can make sure that there's a realistic plan in place. You know, I don't, I, I support the initiative. I just don't want to um, be, I don't want to vote on that piece of the change tonight simply because I'd like us to have a little bit more discussion about it and have an actual proposal to talk about when we're when we're doing it. So um, thank you. So Tina, you're up. That was I, I like the 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 path that you have proposed um, to 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 renew tonight with the understanding that that we'll be developing some enhancements. Um, hopefully this spring. Thank you. Sherry? Sherry? Yeah, thank you. Um, I think in in one of the things that we saw as we were examining that is is that there, there have been some larger changes in the larger society and a change in terms of expectations. Um, I think um, the, the original um, idea to uh, uh, attach a reporting cycle to this and a set of annual goals and objectives um, it is something um, that we discussed and that would certainly be something to um, to add to this um, also in our discussion um, 
there is also a CA policy about working in procurement with local businesses. And I do have some information about that, that we were able to dig up in the CA archives and was passed at the same time back in 2012. And we need to see how that also impacts those who are certified federally as opposed to those who are certified through the state. So there are a couple of interesting wrinkles here that I think we do need to attach to this new policy. As long as we come back to it and make those modifications, I just don't want this to drop through, you know, and be lost again if we don't have time to come back to it at some point. So I would like to ask that we at least set aside a time, you know, a date or a time to come back to it, to have the board take a look at those modifications, which I think are important. Thank you. And I mean, I'd like to get input from Loki in terms of what's reasonable timing on that. Loki, I don't know if you want to address that now or take the remaining questions. I can just quickly say that, you know, we got it and didn't have time to convene staff, you know, right before the meeting, unfortunately. So we did a quick review and what we were going to request tonight is essentially what the board is already doing, which was we're certainly comfortable with extending it. And then I think it was Andy, maybe a week or two ago, had kind of suggested a similar idea. We can, I'm comfortable to committing to returning to it in March. You know, the next two agendas in February are pretty, you know, budget heavy and already booked out. So I'd suggest March. And I think as staff, we would certainly be comfortable with that, but it's certainly up to the board's discretion. Thank you, Loki. Dick? I had to find my button there. Yeah, I think your idea of how to approach this makes a lot of sense, Janet. We definitely want to extend this immediately. And I don't want to get the amendments lost. I've noticed that sometimes you try to get something on the agenda and months will go by and it never shows up again. So let's make sure we get that on the agenda for March. I do recall that we had asked our purchasing people to explain the discrepancy between our goals and the county and state goals. And they did have an explanation. I don't remember what it was. It had something to do with the types of businesses that the different groups hired people for. And so it would be a good idea if we got to hear what the staff had to say on that. But yes, let's get this thing rolling. Let's get it renewed and let's definitely get back to it. Thank you. Andy? Yeah, I was just going to suggest I'd like to modify Dick's motion just to add that one, the extension is for 10 years to 2032, which is what staff recommended. And second, that we also asked staff to come back to us with their look at the recommendations for our March work session so we can discuss it. Dick, do you accept a friendly amendment? I certainly do. And there was, oh yes, there was one other piece of what I was going to say. We did ask purchasing, I think it was a year ago, how we were doing. And frankly, the results were disappointing. So I like the idea of making sure we are monitoring this on a regular basis, annually or whatever, to see how we're doing. Eric? You're still muted if you're talking. I moved to amend to that staff reports our key metrics for this program annually. Andy, was that part of yours? Sorry. No, that's all part of my recommendations. 
um, that Ashley and, and Tina and Shari put together, which which are good recommendations, but I just think we need more time and, and you know, also to see the impact from staff mm -hmm. before we actually put any of those types of recommendations in. That's why I suggested let's come back in March specifically focused yeah. on changes. Um, Eric, would you be satisfied with requesting that staff also include um, the idea of key metrics? Uh, I think we can't, I, I don't like to put something so vague in a statement unless we know what those key metrics are going to be. Um, so I, I think it might behoove us to include that with our recommendations that will come back from staff on that. Okay. Thank you. Susan? You're muted. Thank you. Um, I, I did just want to, just to clarify um, that we have been reporting the percentage of MBE spend and local spend in the quarterly uh, financial report that goes to the board and is posted on the web. It's in the other reports section with the other purchasing data, so it's not easy to find. And if you lose interest in that report before you get to that page, I certainly understand. I don't, but I can understand that you might. But um, we have been doing that for for many years. Thank you, Susan. Okay, can we call to question? So the motion on the table, um, Dick made amended by Andy's and seconded by Andy, is that we will extend the minority business enterprise program policy for 10 years. And we request that we revisit any amendments and recommendations in our March meeting. And that uh, could include additional, well, if, uh, uh, I'm gonna leave it there. And Susan just said that there are two metrics that we currently um, report out on already. And so I think what I would suggest is if there are board members who are interested in something beyond the percentage of and the local spend um, under this policy that you please reach out to the board um, with suggestions so that they can be considered for those March amendments. Um, so let me restate, sorry, uh, that we extend the policy for 10 years and we request that the staff come back to us in March with um, to considering the amendments of the committee and any other recommendations that they may have at that time. Are there any objections to that motion? Okay, uh, motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Okay, so now we move on to the meat of the evening for our draft 23 budget. Okay, um, so I am, uh, the plan this evening is to walk through um, a, a relatively brief slide deck where I am going to um, kind of point out some key points and highlights um, from the uh, significant budget document that, as Susan pointed out, is um, chock full of valuable information, but is what is quite a read. Uh, I then am going to turn it over to Susan, who is going to go through uh, some level of detail, but still at a very organizational level. And then we will have uh, a significant amount of questions still left in this agenda item, uh, or time rather for questions, I should say. So if we could hold questions and really kind of dig into the details at that point, that would be helpful. Um, I don't anticipate the... Uh, presentation being too lengthy, but really trying to set the stage. So uh, as a recap to the process itself, um, I think, and I appreciated uh, Michael's comments and clearly he'd read the transmittal letter. So, uh, you know, portions of this are, are from that. Um, as everyone here knows, we began this process with a special session in July and really have been talking about what a tool the budget is and what a statement of priorities and values it really um, serves uh, in the community. We have um, expanded the community participation 
uh, in this process uh, specifically. Obviously, we've had the board meetings that can have a level of engagement. We had a special information session and answered questions. And then we did uh, an online survey with over 450 people uh, responding. Um, we also, uh, I think with the idea that we used early on based on board guidance of text cases, uh, really uh, created greater visibility into CA operations. Certainly got some of that feedback from you as board members that the pulling apart and kind of reorganizing it. So uh, there was a, a, an ability to see with greater clarity and really try to get to the trade-offs. But on the other hand, um, that interconnectivity and the complexity of operations and that interdependence, I think became very clear. And obviously we're working with a lot of estimates in the test cases and have a lot more detailed numbers in front of us tonight in the actual draft budget. I do want to note, and I'll, I'll close with this as well, just the significant staff effort, but also the community engagement, um, as well as the board's real guidance kind of as we move through this process, I think has really gotten us to uh, a place that we feel very positive about this evening. So this is just a, a, a different kind of graphic. Um, you know, people think and, and, and receive information differently, but I think it's a good uh, demonstration of where we started with a lot more detailed information up front so that then we could interface with the community, uh, give a better education information, get to the priorities, and it was really the CA's board, board's role to listen to those priorities. Uh, obviously, you're engaging with the community all the time as well, and really winnowed down, particularly in the last meeting, where you wanted the guidance to be on the outcomes. And uh, over the past six weeks, over much of the winter holidays, uh, staff has been diligently working to get us to this place tonight. So I think what is important to recognize with a different kind of process is that um, we're really at a refinement. Uh, so instead of introducing the draft budget and kind of getting started, we are closing in on the end and, and certainly see this as a refinement phase because we've answered some of these big questions. What does CA do that's valuable? Um, how is CA positioning for the future? So hopefully uh, the discussion will also reveal that. Uh, it's always good to just reminder where we are in the process. Um, as I indicated, started in July, got a lot of those test cases, a lot more detailed information in October, and then have been diligently working through it um, with the final approval vote uh, scheduled for February 24th. Um, I think that uh, it's also important to note, and I'll mention it again at the end, but we do have an online survey open right now and did decide to go ahead and extend it through Monday. Um, we are at almost uh, just shy of 300 um, when we checked right before the meeting. So people are engaged. I, I do want to say thank you. Village managers in particular um, have been blasting out the online survey since last week. Um, I've seen several newsletters, so we definitely appreciate that. And we're seeing the result. Uh, so also want to just quickly, you know, remind um, anyone who hasn't engaged, you know, previously, obviously all of us have, that the budget, the FY23 budget, is organized around the realignment that we have been kind of moving through the last few months. Uh, we think that it both is an updated structure, but really aligns a little bit more with how people think of what we do, which is, you know, what are our programs and services for the community, and then what are our community operations, and I think um, hopefully also increases understanding about what we're focused on. And, and this org chart in particular reflects um, all, uh, we had a couple of recent changes in the senior leadership team. So that's something that um, we feel really solid. I feel really solid about where our uh, SLT is today. So I, I want to quickly run through some key impacts. And as I said, Susan, is going to, to focus a bit more on the numbers, and then of course we can dig in anywhere you like. But just as an overall setting, I think it's important. We all know, uh, I mean, just in December and, and January this month, as Janet said at the beginning, we're, we're back all virtual again. Um, 
there is continued disruptions, continued changes in behavior, continued questions about what the COVID-19 impact is going to be and how persistent, um, you know, when is the pivot to endemic? What does that mean for our operations? Um, and that's just something that is always present for us. I think uh, good news, uh, we don't see any long-term debt issuance um, in our projections and we do not anticipate I'm going to use the short-term line of credit. So that was certainly something that we've been pleased with as we move through um, the more detailed budget. I'll come back to this, uh, the impact of the minimum wage, and obviously then there's kind of a ripple impact on we've got to do wage compression adjustments. Um, that's certainly a pretty significant factor for us. Um, Obviously, it's always been a priority, but I think we certainly with board guidance, there's a particular focus on ensuring accessibility, which is defined in a variety of ways uh, to CA's programs and services, uh, particularly for residents, um, which uh, is certainly we think reflected in this budget. Um, there is an anticipation and a plan in this budget to open all 23 outdoor pools, have a full program for uh, CNSL. Um, I think significantly and certainly something we heard loud and clear from the uh, community, uh, return to uh, the level of funding for open space maintenance and uh, the aquatic weed harvesting. We, we don't hear that term from the public. We hear the complaint in a different way, but aquatic weed harvesting is the solution. Um, other lakefront maintenance and certainly making sure we're getting our response times as, as quick as we can to urgent work orders. Um, keeping the board priority around uh, stewardship for sustainability, environmental presentation, preservation certainly is still present in this budget. Um, a real focus on new and expanded activities uh, at the downtown lakefront, but, but beyond um, and in other community venues and other places in Columbia, both SCA and then um, in partnership. Uh, we have made not so much an increase in communications funding as much as some strategic uh, changes that are planned, um, enhancements, particularly around engagement and multimedia are captured in this budget. Um, we are defining a, a clear dedicated resource uh, to diversity, equity, and inclusion in initiatives, and that's something that is captured in a few different places in the budget, and then increased financial support for the 10 village community associations. Um, certainly, depending on your particular interest, um, there's many more elements to the budget, but I think these were the big ones that we wanted to make sure to highlight this evening. For the annual charge, uh, where the board ended up um, as we move through the phases uh, prior to tonight, the annual charge rate remains the same. The cap charge rate, uh, yes, the cap rate remains the same. And um, then we had just a, a couple of highlights that reminders of what our maximums are, reminders that, you know, when those increases happened in assessed value, uh, because we do get some questions about property values increasing, is actually phased over three years. I think that's an important thing to remember. It doesn't kind of hit all at once. Um, I will say we did want to clearly state that as staff, uh, given kind of the um, the multi-layered impacts uh, across the global pandemic that um, making changes uh, to this this year and, and kind of handling that communication, let alone um, really understanding that impact was something that we agreed um, strongly with the board to, to keep it where it is for this fiscal year. Uh, so what that means, though, is that we're really looking at our other revenue source, uh, largely in memberships and fees. So while we continue to strive to uh, a goal that has been with CA for a long time, which is to price our programs and services, to really encourage participation, to increase accessibility um, as much as we can. Uh, this is a place where we do see some impact from the minimum wage legislation, uh, which really impacts our community programs and services um, I'd say most specifically, and, and again, I'll uh, return to that in the next slide. But where that leaves us is that the, we're um, forecasting and put in this budget that memberships 
most would increase by a range of five to seven percent. Now, that is typical, uh, or rather just um, just above kind of our typical three percent, which has been the average. But I think that it's also important to remind everyone that um, that is pretty close to the typical consumer price index adjustment annually. And um, it has hovered around 3% for some time. It's projected right now next year to be 7% with inflation. So um, inflation is going to be a factor in addition to COVID and supply chain and you know all the other things. Uh, but we did make an effort to keep increases in um, fees for programs. Uh, closer to the range of three to 4%, which again is uh, pretty typical. And then kept the same idea that we generally do, which is a slightly greater increase for non-residents in comparison to resident rates. So staffing and personnel, um, it's almost half, 45% uh, of our total operating costs. Obviously it's the cornerstone of, of um, so many of our programs and services and so much of our community operations is very driven by our staff, not only presence, but um, expertise and um, certainly uh, an important role in the community. Recruiting for us um, has become and continues to be a challenge. Um, on the one hand, at least we are not alone. Uh, it's happening across the, the US and in, in all industries, but it just makes the labor market that much tighter because we're all in the same boat. So uh, recruitment selection, but obviously really focusing on our retention and taking care of who we have and making sure that we are an employer of choice is really uh, a linchpin to us to delivering those services as well. Uh, so a, a couple of key highlights. Um, this budget does uh, anticipate a pay increase at an average of 3% which is similar to what we have been able to do in FY22. Um, and as a reminder, there was no increase in FY21. Um, I will say that uh, the, the compression number um, and adjustments are separate from that, just to, just to be clear. Uh, the restoration, we started um, just this month with bringing back the 6% contribution to the 401k. So as, um, I say to employees, and I think it's a great recruitment tool for us, we will contribute to your retirement even if you are not. Um, and that's pretty significant, I think, as an employer. So as a reminder, we had had to reduce that in um, the last fiscal year and we're able to just return that. We'll continue that next fiscal year. And um, as a reminder, our, our benefits, um, that's also something that costs are continuing to rise. So. Um, We've had a recent increase and uh, this budget does anticipate an increase of approximately 12%. So minimum wage in particular and the resulting wage compression is worth highlighting. Um, this table gives you an idea of uh, what had been the state schedule and what um, Howard County is making the changes. Um, I'll point out that in a single fiscal year, which is the one we're in, fiscal year 22, so not even fiscal year 23, um, over the span of it, we will actually increase um, by 20% uh, minimum wage. And uh, over the next, this current fiscal year and next, we'll be at almost a 30% change. So just stop and think about, um, that is a significant change for any organization to have a, an expense, a cost line um, change that dramatically in that short a time. And that's not counting COVID and supply chain. So I think that it really brings home how strategic we have to be in thinking about um, what we should be focusing on and what's really important for CA and thinking forward for the future it has so much to do with our business model and how we're going to be ensuring that we have a quality team that um, wants to be part of this organization. Uh, so capital budget, um, the, the quick overview, obviously uh, an increase this year, pretty significant. Um, we were at 8 million for this fiscal year. There is an increase to 11 million. Um, we're not at pre-COVID, we had been at 15 but um, certainly taking a strong step towards that. 
Um, absolutely still holding up the CA board's goal of uh, open space stewardship um, and preservation in particular, but definitely still keeps a focus on maintenance and safety related uh, reinvestments that need to happen. So the key investments, again, there's a, a lot of detail in the budget document around specific projects, but these are some key ones to bring forward. Um, over a million going towards a lot of our sustainability initiatives, over a million with, um, I think what a lot of people think about our pathways and our bridges, our plazas, all those kinds of components. Uh, significant renovations at both the Art Center and at Stonehouse, as well as uh, at Historic Oakland, and so Stonehouse is in Longreach, Historic Oakland Town Center. Of course, the tot lot replacements, and then some Category 3 um, allocations to highlight significantly in um, open space, uh, the villages, um, we've got some outdoor pool projects, and then uh, some improvements at the downtown lakefront. Um, I'll close my comments and turn it over to Susan, but I first really do want to take a moment in, in this more formal setting of the board meeting to really acknowledge and express appreciation for the, you know, very significant efforts of the senior leadership team. But I really do want to call out um, our managers and the amount of effort that went in, particularly in our first phase, and moving towards these test cases, a lot of uh, different scenarios that we tested. Uh, so there were some teams that had to come up with three different budgets um, in that first phase. So a lot of work, uh, a lot of thoughtful reflection, and I think we got a really good product out of it. I definitely want to specifically thank Susan Crabby as our CFO and Lynn Schwartz as our Director of Finance and, of course, very specifically the accounting division and the budget team. Um, and I think that, you know, this body, the Board of Directors, has really engaged in this process, um, has been uh, very responsible in reviewing information and bringing critical questions forward, and I think that our product is stronger for it. And of course, I want to definitely take a moment to just say thank you to all our team members. Um, the ability to uh, be thinking about this, you know, um, still without COVID being finished and already delivering such quality programs and services, rebuilding some uh, due to the pandemic and already um, envisioning what's next has been a real joy with this team. And, um, you know, the budget, again, is such an expression of that kind of work. So I definitely want to acknowledge that. Uh, so now I'm going to turn it over to Susan Crabby to walk through um, some more detailed financial information, but still predominantly at the organizational level. So Susan, I'll flip the slides for you. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Lakey. And, you know, I just want to uh, point out that, um, uh, just acknowledge Lakey's leadership and, and her, her vision and innovation, you know, this, um, to have 450 people engaged uh, pre earlier and 300 at this point. And one of the, you know, some of the metrics are, did you, is this your first time participating in this process? And, and for many of them, for most in this round, it is. And so to, to have the to have the vision and come up with a process that has engaged so many more people than I've ever seen before is um, really extraordinary. And you know, she's, you're keeping a, a great, uh, consistent, clear focus on resource stewardship and uh, just grateful for that continued commitment to, to CA's financial condition. Um, so um, we can move to the next slide and, and um, review that a little bit. I wanted to just give you an update uh, we reviewed the second quarter FY22 financials um, in December. So we're uh, in January is the last month of the third quarter. So we'll be closing January next week and, and then begin that process. But I wanted to uh, remind you and uh, continue to, to make it clear that CA is in very sound financial condition. I think what we've proven um, in that under uh, – extreme uncertainty, uh, we could still develop and uh, 
execute against uh, a budget um, over now several years of just uncertainty, not just for CA, but for our, uh, our, our region and, and really globally. So um, and you should be um, yeah, congratulated for that, you know, as, as the strategic leaders of the organization. And, um, we appreciate that. So we also, I think, continue to demonstrate our track record that is uh, very solid. We are innovative, but we're deliberate. We plan, we're efficient, we execute uh, effectively, and then we review thoughtfully and actually quickly. So another one of, uh, you have heard Lakey say it, we're going to focus on continuous uh, process improvement. So that uh, is reflected in our financial condition currently and uh, in the projections we have in the 23 budget. Our cash position is strong. Uh, and as you know, we began funding a cash reserve in FY21. And uh, that um, just really glad to have that uh, stewardship by the board as well. So, you know, no one knows what the long-term impacts of the pandemic will be. Uh, we don't uh, even know what the mid-range impacts will be. So we just have to continue to uh, do our best work and uh, plan uh, thoroughly and carefully, and then re continually review the results against that plan and, and make adjustments. So there's, uh, in, in my mind, and I think it's uh, accurate, there is no return to normal, if normal means pre-COVID. Um, that uh, has changed in so many ways for the workforce, for our community, for our, our customers and their, their interests and desires. And so we just uh, we um, need to focus on, on what the new uh, normal is for CA. So. Um, next slide. So now to, to pull up some numbers, uh, one of the things that is frequently asked is uh, how much annual charge income is going to the various departments of CA or the various activities. So this schedule is, is an interesting one. It's a kind of a modified cash basis. So the attempt is to show the cash coming in, the cash uh, going out, and how much, um, you know, from a relative standpoint, each department is dependent on the annual charge. So um, it, it, you can read across, and it flows across. So that might not be clear. The cash income, we subtract cash operating expenses administrative allocations and get to the, to a net annual charge usage. Excuse so, me, Susan, I have a question. Uh, you list up in the corner here that this is in uh, thousands, and I'm looking at the numbers and they don't seem to be in thousands. Uh, you're right, you're right, it's not. So that this one is um, one, one of, probably the only one in the document that is not in thousands. So that's my mistake there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So it is on page four. I should have said that if you, you know, once you want to look at it uh, later or again. Um, and I want to point out too that um, obviously community operations, the significant uh, focus there is on open space stewardship and environmental uh, uh, stewardship and sustainability is the single largest uh, uh, need for uh, annual charge income. So um, any. I, I can. I think I'll move on, like if you don't mind. And I'll talk to you. Okay. So um, here, on this one, Dick, it is in thousands. So good catch there. Uh, these charts are in the budget, and they're also um, in the annual report. You've seen them before. So these are on this in the same format of presentation. So they're generally a cash basis. The one on the left shows you where the money comes from. So we're projecting. For FY23 in the draft budget, total resources of $71,427,000. The largest single component of that is the residential annual charge. And you see that's 41, a little over 41%. But what I think is worth noting is that community programs and services at $26,211,000 is actually 89% of that residential annual charge. So that's a, a, a significant um, uh, resource for CA, um, and those are the memberships and fees and uh, tuition and all of the other um, user-related, community-related resources. 
Um, also want to point out that we don't think about it a lot because the commercial annual charge is not doesn't rec represent a lot of owners, property owners, about 1,100, but it's you know over 21% of our resource uh, incoming resources to the organization. So on the right, where is the money used? So this shows you uh, in by program or by um, department where the money goes, but it also uh, gives you an indication of the capital expenditures. And there's $11 million in the upper, upper right there. So that's about 15% of, of the total uh, resources. And uh, debt repayment shows up on this schedule and not on the previous one. So it's almost $5 million. Um, you, would, you don't see um, communications and marketing in here because that's, uh, those expenses are allocated to the other departments as customers of those services. Okay, I think the next one. So this schedule shows a, a this is a very summarized um, cash flow statement. So this is showing you in a in a C, in a uh, from a CA wide perspective what, where the cash is coming from and how it's generally used and what our net position is. So if you if you focus on the and um, I wanted to acknowledge. Um, Andy had pointed out um, that we were missing our footnotes on here, and Andy will pick those up in the um, final. So that was an editing oversight here. Um, so for FY23, um, you can see at the bottom, you see the uh, increase in the capital spend. And uh, the combination of that increase and the um, uh, reduction in Cash generated from operations just above, so going from 16 million to 15.3, uh, we end up actually projecting that CA we would not be borrowing, uh, but we would be using cash. It would not be generated cash. We would actually uh, use some of our um, not the reserve that we set up, not the emergency funds, but the cash that we uh, still have uh, from the net financing proceeds from the new financing back in 2021 and through our uh, expense savings and cost reductions that, that we've uh, implemented since COVID. Uh, okay, and then next, um, this is the, the detailed schedule. So if you're on the audit committee or you come to those meetings, you, we go through this, you see this format every quarter. And this is a, more of a traditional profit and loss type statement, statement of activities and it's on an accrual basis. So big difference here, just technically, you see depreciation and not capital or debt repayments. But you see the income is the same. Uh, I just want to hit a couple of the key variants in the middle. That uh, annual charge income for 23 is budgeted to be very similar to 22. Uh, tuition and enrollment is, is in, we project increasing because uh, you know, we anticipate getting back to full capacity at the school age services program. Um, and uh, direct memberships has been increased and membership allocation. So combined membership income, the 23% increase, as Lakey pointed out, 5 to 7% of that is, is increases, uh, rate increases, and the remainder is what we expect uh, in new growth and returning memberships. On the expense side, you know, like you pointed out very uh, clearly that the personnel costs are um, our single largest uh, line item, 45% uh, of the total, and they're increasing significantly. 12% uh, of that, uh, or you know, there's 12% increase in minimum wage, 12% in the uh, health insurance, and um, the 3% increase. So, and there is some staffing increase as certainly as we expand capacity in the schools, we need more staff to provide those services. So for, for things like that, as we continue to build up our programs, there are some staffing uh, increases related to that. Uh, fees are significantly up this year too. We project um, a 15% increase in uh, the lake maintenance and use of outside paving contractors. And that's where a significant portion of the de &I investment is in um, outsource, uh, outside assistance, fees for programs, and uh, educational opportunities. Um, and then uh, a question was asked about depreciate or about interest expense. Why did that go down? Because um, we are 
you know, aren't reducing our borrowing, but we are in a way. So our long-term debt is amortized as like a mortgage. Um, the payments stay the same every month, but as the principal's paid down, the interest decreases as well. So just like um, your mortgage. And then, let's see. Next slide, please. Okay, so capital, this is um, uh, the proof, uh, and you, you've seen this, uh, it's changed only slightly since the fall. Um, these are the proposed capital projects um, we, in, this, in the category system that has been used by DA for quite a few years now, and it's been very helpful, I feel. Um, you can see that many of these are uh, open space and uh, environmental and sustainably oriented. And, and yet we are picking up some things that uh, represent an, an, uh, a, a reinvestment in infrastructure, HVAC, the work at Stonehouse and Art Center. Um, even um, I wanted to point out the ice rink slab replacement is uh, a, a new infrastructure or an infrastructure improvement. Um, and I think that's it. Uh, there's a, just a lot of uh, information in the budget. I hope that um, you take some time to, to read some of the department summaries. It's very informative. And I think this would be a good year to do that. If you've done it in the past, take a look this year because um, they've been refreshed. There's just a lot of different uh, initiatives going on. And I think it would be really helpful for context and also for you to be able to go back to your villages and out in the community and be able to, to talk you know, knowledgeably about the budget. Thank you. Okay, so the floor is open for questions. Um, Andy, I know you sent a list. Were they all addressed or were there outstanding ones? Um, there are a couple outstanding, but I'd rather give some of the other board members an opportunity you know, before I just kind of hog the conversation. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, Susan? I would just, uh, a couple of uh, Andy's questions and one from Eric uh, had to do with membership rates, and I um, thought maybe it would be a good idea to ask Dan to comment on those. Um, and since two board members asked similar questions. Okay, um, thank you. Um, Andy asked uh, about the increase in golf um, with, with it being around the 5% mark, it was gonna be about $100 a year. Um, and if uh, the thought that something of that magnitude would drive the price away or drive the drive away membership. Um, there's, there's two answers. Um, the, the first is that any increase always has the potential to do that, whether it's a dollar or it's a hundred dollars. Um, uh, but historically, what I've seen um, is that attrition with membership rates is kind of a hockey stick. And the curve doesn't shoot up until you get over that seven. When you get around eight or nine percent, then it shoots up dramatically. Uh, so we're, we're staying within that 5% range on average um, is, is a relatively safe range, but it's not, doesn't, we're not immune to, to people choosing to, to go someplace else. Um, but $100 seems like a lot, but again, it's only 5%. It's just a big number because the membership's a big number to begin with. Um, so the, the increase is, is relative to somebody going up $10 who's paying $100 membership or $50 membership. Um, so uh, there are, are some, some concerns, but I'm not overly concerned. Does that answer your question, Andy? And um, Eric, you had asked yes. about, um, I'm sorry, didn't mean to cut you off. E Eric had asked uh, about the membership allocation and uh, the answer to that is yes, that the um, CA Fit and Play membership gives members access to golf at, at Fairway Hills and Hobbits, so that's why they do get uh, a portion of that allocation. And actually, um, non-golf members make up about 21%, actually FY21, 
they made up about 21% of the usage at Hobbit's Glen. So it is a, it is a pretty substantial number of, of non-golf members, the pit and play members, who take advantage of that benefit. So is that an exclusive membership benefit to the CA pit and play versus the play membership versus just having a Columbia card? Yes. Uh, so only CA, CA fit and play members can, and people with golf memberships can go play at Fairway Hills and Hobbit's Glen at those golf courses. Anyone can play at Fairway Hills as a public course. Okay. Um, and other residents can play Hobbit's Glen. They can't uh, reserve a tee time. They could potentially walk on and pay the guest fee. Um, but uh, to have reservation privileges, that is a fit and play membership. But that's how the membership allocations work. Um, the, the allocations are membership allocations. So for memberships that contain multiple locations, that's what gets allocated out. Um, so there are, if somebody's um, using a one fit member, has a one fit membership, it only goes to that specific club. Or if they have a five day golf membership, it only goes, I, I take that back because I've had to play. A seven day golf membership, it only goes to the golf. It's the multi-site memberships that get allocated out because they have access to those sites. So, so someone with a one fit membership couldn't reserve a tee time at Hobbits, whereas someone with a CA fit and play membership could reserve a play time, a play time at Hobbits. They have to pay for it. And someone with a golf membership could reserve it and just play. Is that, is that the way it works? Correct. Okay. Sherry? Um, yeah, um, thank you. So right now it looks as if there are four different membership types um, that, that you can do for golf. Um, and it looked like um, in looking at the, the previous numbers that we had received that um, CA Fit and Play, the number of residents was about um, – 3,200, um, or that was, I, that's what it looked like in, in the, the information or that was, uh, I don't know whether that was rounds or that, <laughs> that was numbers, and non-residents was 1,500. Can, can you explain what those figures? Um, because I don't know where you're getting them from. Okay. When I actually went through the, um, the draft budget, the previous budget, um, the, the numbers of residents, um, and the numbers of non-residents looked almost even, but in some areas there were more non-residents than residents. Is that correct? Uh, you're asking a very big question. Um, I, I don't know whether you're talking usage, whether you're talking, I, I don't know what, what the numbers refer to. Is it number of members? Is it usage? Is it? I, well, you, you broke the, the golf memberships down into five day and seven day and daily and golf fit and play. Okay. So, so when you, when you broke all of that down and then I re-added things up, <laughs> um, at one point it looked like the number of non-residents was 206 and the number of residents was 180. Um, when it went through um, uh, uh, different sets of totals, it looked like the number of the total number of residents was 333, and then the number of non-residents was 386. Um, this was this was some background that you gave us prior to the last draft. Uh, there's only a little over 300. There's like 380 golf members total. In all of the the four categories. Yes. Yeah, there was, uh, in, at the end of December, there was, I just looked at this this morning, I was talking to Rodney, there was um, 100 and, 
seven day and 112 go fit and play. Okay. And, um, and how much of an increase did that represent? I just want to make sure that your questions are focused on the, on the budget and not just curiosity. No, no, it's based on the budget because we're looking at income and we're looking at expenditure and we're looking at, um, I'm trying to get a sense of how much of a change, how much of an increase there was over the past year. It seemed that there was an increase over the past year. In, in what? In, in golf altogether. Yeah, I don't, um, I don't have the P&L in front of me for last year's numbers. All right, you know, I, I can, we can do this offline. I'll, I'll ask you a more detailed question offline then. That's okay. I'm not trying to put any pressure on it. I, I'm just trying to get a sense of the figures with regard to the budget. Thanks. Andy. Um, Dan, I was just wondering if you could um, just uh, explain a little bit on the tennis fees. Yeah. Um, so I got a little lost because I, I, you said we're not charging for, um, you know, hobbits, um, the racquetball court, and the the yeah. So the um, up until a couple of years ago, hobbits. The outdoor courts at Hobbits were the only outdoor courts that had a tennis fee. Um, and it was just a couple of dollars. And we took it away, but it was never taken out of the budget for some reason. It was an oversight. Okay. Um, with the pandemic, we missed it. Um, and the reason was we just, we weren't charging outdoor fees anywhere. It was just a legacy charge. Um, and so we decided to make it equitable with the other outdoor courts um, and, and took it away. But it's actually been away for like, it went away right before the pandemic. Um, and then with the scramble with the budgets, we really hadn't updated the rate sheets and we, we caught it this year. So we, we haven't been charging for, we don't charge for any of the outdoor tennis courts. So, so basically you don't even need a membership to use. Yeah, you need a membership, but we don't charge. Membership. For okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think Eric asked a question or somebody asked a question about the fee line for tennis. Was that Andy or was that Eric? That's probably me. <laughs> um, yeah, maybe it was. Um, yes, what, what you see on the, the indoor outdoor tennis is all of the tennis courts. And then on the actual P&Ls, there's a, there's a separate P&L for each individual site. So it's it's wherever we collect, but in this case, we only collect now, collect court fees at um, Athletic Club and Long Reach. Thanks, Dan. Yep. Susan. Yes, thank you. Um, there was another question about the package plan phase in. So for those of you who were on the board um, it, several years ago when we changed the mem membership structure and led us through that, um, we had a, a, a particular um, limited package plan um, membership that we phased, we were going to, we, we eliminated. So it didn't have, we, we uh, replaced it with a CA fit and play. But rather than um, force people to make a change uh, all at one time that was pretty dramatic, we, and we added a lot of benefits to it. We just got rid of this one that had less, less benefits. Uh, we phased in those increases over a number of years. So that should, um, would have uh, ended with FY22, but we extended it um, another year because um, we didn't make any price changes really in FY21, and it would just be too big a jump. So we're just, we just extended that um, another year. So I think it's been now, gosh, six or six or seven years, uh, and um, and then they will um, those memberships will have all the benefits. Uh, they will be CA fit and play memberships with those benefits, and will be at that renewal price. But it won't be till next year, at, or at twenty four. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Susan. Welcome, Tina. 
So I wanted to ask a question about um, staff retention strategies um, that you're going to be developing. I noticed that the um, that we're all talking and anticipating 7% inflation, but only talking about 4% or I'm sorry, 3% increases. Um, and I know that's going to hit folks at the bottom of the pay scale the hardest. I'm wondering what, what plans or thoughts are, are being assembled to, to help redress that. So those are uh, increases outside of the wage compression increases that will also be done to the, uh, address the, the uh, impact of the minimum wage. So those lower uh, folks at the lower end of the scale will be lifted up through that process uh, of those compression adjustments as well. And then also we're focusing on um, the benefits. So we did not, um, you know, we, we, that the increases in, um, we try to make sure that we don't, uh, that CA keeps the bulk of the increase for the medical insurance, for example, and then um, to increase the, the contribution on the 401k to, to return that is, a, is, is, we think, a big component of retention. And, um, you know, again, as like you pointed out, uh, whether people contribute or not, CA will. So, so those are, are some of the streams of uh, opportunity that we're working on to, for retention. Thank you. Eric? Thanks. So uh, I got a question on uh, page uh, 103 about the Department of Administrative Services. So I noticed that the total operating expenses for the that department's going up by about $1.5 million or 18%, which seems a lot higher than uh, some of the other departments. So I'm just wondering why that department has such a, a sharp increase in total operating expenses. So the, uh, a couple things. One is um, we, we, that department uh, incurred significant cuts in, the, in, in staffing in the COVID um, environment. And we're returning uh, some of that staff, especially uh, mainly in HR. And um, and then, um, so if this is the increase over FY22. Uh, also, we are that's where the um, DEI dollars are. So that's um, $120,000 of that increase. And we are picking up some additional uh, IT. Uh, applications and you know we didn't have multi-factor in the previous uh, authentication in the previous budget or, uh, and it's in here now and we uh, have some other uh, IT related um, expenses and, um, and 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 commitments to catch up on so we deferred some other things uh, related to um, uh, mainly to technology that are in there this year so um, combination of those cuts uh, and then um, picking up DEI and uh, the um, tech in, in impact. So how many extra FTEs does that uh, entail? Uh, I believe it is two and a half, but I'll have to double check. Yes. Well, I, you can probably guess that I'm going to switch and talk about the capital budget and um, specifically the six cents pot lot. So um, I wanted to see, you know, I think Ashley had asked about the, it's like 511,000 that's allocated for tot lot replacements. And so, you know, I know we have a cap on the capital budget, but I'm wondering if what might be able to be done to find the additional whatever 90,000 or whatever it is that you think we would need to put in there so that that community can have the Twin Towers version. Um, I don't want to take away from another village, but, you know, I'm assuming that's a certain number of tot lots that you have slated for replacement or repair. And is there a way to push something or, or how we might be able to make that happen? 
So if that's, if that's directed at me, it's about 1.5 tot lots incrementally that we would have to set aside. And I don't have, um, so the capital budget is not, um, doesn't exceed our needs. And so therefore there would be something that wouldn't get done. We would prioritize that tot lot over other tot lots and other work wouldn't get done and other tot lots would potentially be closed. Okay, well, I would just like to sort of, you know, and I don't know, you guys can sort of guide me as to the way to do this, is I would like to move that that tot lot be prioritized. It's already been closed for two years. So I'd like to move that one up and see if we can make an exception for the, you know, above and beyond the standard tot lot budget so we can um, get that community back to having a top lot there. So we will, that that's noted and we'll, that will be something that we would revisit and come back in February with that uh, proposal. Well, can I make a okay. clarification? I mean, it's informational, it's not, um, so there's really two ways to handle this in the capital budget. It's either to keep that tot lot, you know, being more than the typical inside of the tot lot line item. And as Dennis indicated, then some other tot lots that are represented in that item would not be done. Uh, or there, um, the board could name it as a category one project uh, and take money from another line item in the capital budget. But I, I guess I want to clearly state that staff's position would be that the total capital budget stays at 11 million. And if the board supports having um, the six pence tot lot in particular move forward, we would be cutting it somewhere. So I would like board feedback on do you want to keep it in the tot lot line item and we cut other tot lots? Do you want to name it as a category one and cut something else? Or do you not want to allocate those funds? So I, I would appreciate, staff would appreciate having that clarity. Ashley. Yep, so I wanted to get a little bit more clarification probably from Dennis. So the Twin Towers, again, coming back to it, um, so I know it's the wood one that would have to be replaced. What on a ten-year cycle, nine-year cycle? So, so this is to put in a different type of structure that's more that has more metal and um, and polycarbonate. So it's not to replace it in kind. That cost would be even greater. That cost is around two hundred and fifty to replace it in kind. So this proposes an expanded basic pot lot um, instead of the little. Instead of the rascal, it becomes something else that's twice as large. What's the life cycle of it? That life cycle we think is about 25 years, 20, 25 years. Okay, so it's it would be similar materials then, or uh, it would last for about the same amount of time as the newer ones that we're putting in. Correct, exactly. Okay, but it would be 250000 versus the 80000 so, so the 250 is to repl replace it directly in kind. Okay. With the wood structure. And about 200 to replace it with something that is um, fabricated out of metal and polycarbonate. Oh, got it. Okay, so we could replace it to look similar in size, still address an older demographic, and last for 25 years, but it would cost about 200,000 versus 80,000. So it's bigger, but, but it's not going to look the same. It's sure. going bigger and better, but I wouldn't say it looks the same. Realistically, we're not going to be able to get the same aesthetic if we're not going to be able to use the same materials because it's not going to last as long. The bugs are going to eat it. Correct. If it's, it's, if it's safe for kids, it's safe for bugs. I remember you telling me. Yes. <laughs> right, bugs like to eat it. Okay, great. Thank you. Jenny? Thanks, Janet. I think the issue a couple of years ago when we started to uh, study tot lots um, was the issue of what is a tot lot, who does it serve, and what is a playground. Playground costs a lot more than a tot lot. 
So that's when you begin to serve other populations than what is normally smaller children in a tot line. And it's gonna be much more expensive and probably larger. So I'm not sure if we're talking about here a playground as opposed to a tot lot. We keep saying tot lot, but it sounds like what the community wants is a more expensive playground. Correct. Okay, so when we, we I think we said, uh, when we get to playgrounds, they would be voted on individually uh, because they are more expensive. Uh, and also, uh, and I know this was just for Oakland Mills, but we had offered to look at trades if our community wanted, and we're not asking for one, okay, but if our community wanted an area like near a neighborhood center or something like that, for instead of a tot lot that's there, a playground, then we should be willing to give up some other tot lots in the community that don't really, uh, say are in a, you've already done the study of all the tot lots, say they're in an area where uh, it doesn't make any sense anymore, or in fact, it's dangerous for, for environmental reasons or for crime, et cetera. And the community really no longer sees a need for one or two other tot lots, but they're sufficiently close to this thing that they want as a playground and the community would be willing to give up the others, which would save CA money. Uh, and then it would be a trade. And that was something that we were very interested in doing, but apparently CA isn't interested in working with us on that. And that's where you sort of say, well, if we want something really great and big and expensive, maybe we should be contributing. Okay, thank you. Dick? Uh, I, uh, I know it's not my village, but I am, uh, I'd like to do something on this sixpence lot. A uh, couple of things. First of all, we've had really high community involvement on this. We've gotten dozens and dozens of letters on this. It's obviously something that the community cares very, very much about. I've other than swimming pools, I don't think we've ever gotten this kind of response on a community project. And that kind of involvement really needs to be rewarded. Uh, I, I, I just believe that this is something people really care about. And it, it's it's something where we got to really uh, get back in there. Uh, it's another thing about it is that um, it used to have, apparently, from what people tell me, a kind of iconic design, and it was a monument. It was a major community feature. And I hate to see something like that replaced with something that's kind of rinky-dink. I, I really would like to see uh, an effort made to try to do uh, what was done before. Um, it's kind of a historical preservation kind of, a, of an act. Um, and uh, I know that my uh, village uh, had a tot lot, which actually got this whole tot lot controversy going because we spent too much money on it. And I just have to say that my community loves it. It is a central focus. Uh, it gets a lot of use. Um, and... Um, it really has brought people together. So I think from time to time, you know, a little something extra really pays back. So I would like to support this um, six pence project. Um, I have something else I'd like to get into, but I'll back off for a little bit. You have one and a half minutes, Dick, if you want to use it. Okay. I have some questions here about fees. Uh, I'm looking here at the uh, Office of uh, General Counsel. I see uh, a huge amount of money spent. I'm assuming this is on outside counsel. Is that where we tuck that outside counsel money? So it's not tucked. Uh, it's clear there for everyone to see. And uh, yes, that is where the outside uh, legal fees go. And when okay. we uh, started this, uh, budget. We didn't know how, you know, we uh, weren't okay. sure about. I just wanted. To, I just want to know what it was, and I noticed that uh, on the 22 versus the 23, uh, we've doubled our budget. Uh, yeah, it's 
So what you should look at is the 22 estimate. The 23 budget was too, was too low. It, it, it was it was lower than you know the three previous years, and so that was that was uh, not a good budget. Okay. Now uh, one more thing on fees. I'm looking at uh, uh, the page 117. Uh, this is board of directors. Uh, we've got a FY19 figure of 98,000, which drops to 53,000 in 20. And then uh, we got some figures of 1, 2, 1, 3, 2,000 uh, in uh, subsequent years. Uh, what, what was that big jump and where, where did it all go? So I would have to go back and look at that. I don't know. I don't recall at the top of my head. I, I do know that one thing was there, the board had engaged uh, uh, real estate advice and outside a real estate attorney, and I'm pretty sure that got charged to board page in uh, back in 19 or 20. For, oh, okay, um, yeah, 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 okay, that makes sense. And we just don't ex expect, expect that kind of expenditure in the future on fees for the board. At, not at this point, right. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I'm a, I just had a comment on the six pence tot lot. Um, I, I mean, I don't, I doubt that there's anyone here who doesn't want the community to have something like that. But what I was curious about and um, was the idea of, you know, maybe creative solutioning around this, like, you know, CA allocates the amount that is average per our tot lot policy and i'm just wondering like if there's any opportunity for like local businesses or something to sort of pitch in and make up some of the additional funds and then like you know put a plaque or something in the park that would allow them you know to get some um recognition for their contribution toward the park or something like that you know like obviously 80 grand would be a lot for a community to raise but maybe if you found enough businesses that were interested in um, participating, uh, you know, I'm just wondering if there are some solutions, something like that, that might offer us. Um, real real estate actually. agents would be a target there. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. And I mean, I just, I don't know who it would be or, you know, but, you know, I'm wondering if it could be something like UCA says, we will put up this much, but if you want to try to make up the difference, then we would love to put this bigger one in for you. Um, so, you know, just a thought, only only from the standpoint of, obviously, it's very difficult at this point to take ninety or $100,000 and shift it, um, you know, because then, then we have to say, like, that tot lot get, is getting priority over whatever else that money would have gone to. So I think that's what makes it a hard trade-off, not because it's not a worthwhile project, just that, um, yeah, so... Um, Andy? Yeah, um, for our, our work session coming up in February, um, so can you make sure that the, we actually have the figures for the six pence hot lot? Mm -hmm. we, we've been throwing out a couple like estimates, but I'd, I'd really like to kind of see exactly what we're talking about. Um, and then the second thing is also, can we have the information on the um, the phases for the art center and Stonehouse rehab and at least maybe an estimate of future costs. So I just want to make sure that um, we have a good good understanding of what all. I can give you, I can give you some general information on, on Stonehouse and art center now, or I can give that to you in writing. Whatever you no, give it in writing, you know, for our next meeting. That way everybody gets to see it and it's written. Okay. Thanks, Dennis. Eric? Yeah, I just want to reiterate on uh, what you said that I'm, there used to be a buy a brick program in the uh, Columbia Town Center. I'm not sure something like that could work for uh, tall lots where people buy a, a plaque um, and that could go for the tall lot. That might be something to look into. But my other concern is that, okay, we have tons and tons of testimony, tons and tons of emails um, about one particular top lot. And I'm, I'm not sure we want to make it a pattern that if you want to get a new top lot, that they need, people need to inundate us with emails and testimony. I'd like to give a little more control about um, improving the tunnel lights back to the villages so that each village might have a 
allocation to improve, and they and they can decide how to use that allocation to to improve the talents as best as they see fit. Sure. Um, yeah, I, 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 you know, Janet, I really liked your idea uh, about thinking creatively about how to um, bring uh, additional monies in. Um, when we were talking about it, I mean, when we talked about a, a tot lot policy, we were kind of saying that we would establish um, some minimums or at least some some parameters around how tot lots would be replaced. Um, and if we're seeing elements now where replacement of the original tot lots is not going to be uh, always possible because of issues like the way the you know the uh, the wood is treated and other things of that kind you know that changes um, the replacement um, that was the value we were looking at replacing um, but what strikes me is that you know yet again we are all residents of the county the county has built playgrounds lots of playgrounds around lots of communities in in the county and um, I would be very much in favor of, of CA getting behind uh, the Hickory Ridge community and um, and asking for assistance for that community as far as this uh, playground is concerned, if that's something that the community feels is such a priority. Uh, Susan? So my comment's not on the six ten tot lot, so I can hold it until that is done. I think. I mean, I think it's okay to bring it up here. I, we can. Okay. I mean, okay. No, I, I just wanted to cl uh, correct my uh, gross uh, uh, guess under estimate for Eric. So the FTE increase from the FY twenty two estimate to the twenty three budget for administrative services is like seven point six. That includes um, the in FY22 for half the year the director of IT position was vacant, so there was no dollars, you know, for half the year. So that's that position. There's another vacant position in IT, and uh, that is being filled. And then we um, uh, added one there and added a several positions in HR and half a person, half STE in accounting and a half in purchasing, but. Those uh, two accounting is still uh, under be below what it was pre COVID staffing, even with those additions. So I apologize for that. I shouldn't have guessed. It's on um, page let's see, 19, I think. Nine. nine, nine. Sorry, nine, not nineteen. So, so Eric, there in in those um, pages eight and nine show the changes in FTE or as calculated. So, uh, page nine. Okay. Hey, Dick. Yeah, I uh, just wanted to say, Jan, I thought it was a brilliant idea going to see if we could get some sponsorship for that uh, play, uh, playground. Um, and I was not kidding when I said real estate agents, they will put millions of dollars in the soccer fields and things like that. Uh, this would be something that I would think real estate agents would jump at because uh, they're, they're always looking for publicity. This raises housing values. And I would suggest that uh, either Hickory Ridge or maybe Dennis wants to just make some inquiries uh, to see who would be willing to sponsor something like that. Um, Jess? Yeah, two quick things. One, I, I put in the chat, but I just wanted to, to say it out loud so it, it's official. 
that when if you do bring back information, Dennis, on um, the hot lot stuff about the actual cost, I would like to see. I know you have a whole plan for when things are replaced, and to see what the impact would be of prioritizing six pence over another tot lot or two, and what kind of impact that might have on those other, um, you know, tot lots and whether they might be closed longer, that kind of thing, so we can get a real sense of the trade-off. And then my other thing was I, I love that people are thinking creatively about how to fund the tot lot, but I think it would be nearly impossible to get the county to put money towards um, something that's built on CA property and has always been CA's responsibility. Um, and and then my concern about the sponsorship thing, not that it couldn't be done, but I don't know any real estate that would be happy with a little gold plaque that, that would advertise their services. They would probably want a big full color logo. And I'm not sure that we want to start a precedent of having advertising along the pathways. So um, while I, I love the creative thinking, um, I think, you know, I think it's more realistic to try to see where we can, you know, what trade-offs we might be able to make in the existing capital budget. And again, I mentioned that at the end of the last fiscal year, Hickory Ridge gave back, I want to say $70,000 is the number that comes to mind when we made that you know, policy that they could, villages could give back money and it would go to projects in their village. But there I specifically asked whether that money could be used for the top lot and was told that that's just for like environmental stewardship projects. So if we were able to make an exception and in this case, you know, that is, Hickory Ridge has already given back $70,000. So, um, that was, that was my comment. Thank you. Um, Eric? Yeah, I just wanted to follow up with uh, Susan's comments. So on, on page 19, I see um, FTEs of 30, 32, and 40 for administrative services. And so those are all, are all post-COVID numbers. Do you have a sense of what the FTEs were pre-COVID? I'll look them up. Okay, thanks. Okay, any other budget questions for this evening? Andy. Okay, um, my last question really was the uh, the lakefront improvements, um, the 500K, not that I oppose them, but is the board going to get a chance to weigh in on actually what the plan is? Because the, the write-up was pretty specific about the kinds of things they're looking for, and I... I'm not sure. I'm not sure we have a consensus yet from the board as to what should be done. So, um, Jan, do you want me to speak to that, or? Yeah, if you would, that'd be great. Thank you. So, um, so what we would do is take advantage of this design work that's already taken place in Bailey Park, and move some of that over to the band shell and the pavilion and perhaps some furnishings, depending on how far that money goes. And this is an intermediate five to 10 year solution to um, waiting for that long-term multi-million dollar improvement to Lakefront. There's the, that, that property is so incredibly valuable. And you know, 10 years in the future or eight years or seven, you know, there's gonna be a major um, uh, rehab to that whole area. Howard Hughes is gonna spend some money and at that time, we can create a grand plan. This is just something we can do. If you look down at the lakefront, Bailey Park looks great. And then the fountain looks good. And the rest of it looks shabby. And so this is to kind of to get rid of that shabby look without spending $3 million ahead of Howard Hughes having a plan for the lakefront. Um, so that, that is my thought on it. Andy, did you want to respond to that? I, I, no, I mean, I don't. I don't I wasn't, I'm not necessarily opposed to it. It's just that 
I see Bailey Park, and I'm not sure what exactly I would take from Bailey Park over <laughs> to the rest of the lakefront, like the the pergola structure. Well, I'm not sure that I necessarily want that particular structure on, you know. So, it's, you know, my, my problem is <clears throat> I get the concept, <clears throat> but I really want to kind of know what it is that we're going to bring over and what, what it's going to look like. Um, and th that's where more of my, as I'll say, concern is. I think I think we do need improvements. I think 500,000, yep, I'm willing to support. But I'd really like to to see a little bit more of what exactly it's 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 going to look like. What are we bringing over? Um, are we changing the light standards down there? Because those are really nice poles. Um, so, are we, yeah, you know, that type of thing. So I, I'm just wondering. So the um, five hundred thousand dollars is not going to buy CA a signature band shell. Okay. Um, in addition to which, we ha I think we have to be careful that the massing of that band shell doesn't overtake the entire downtown where the statues are. So I met with Design Collective who did the design work on Bailey Park. And it's really so, kind of minimalistic and simple to take that form um, that is in Bailey Park and some of those colors that they've already designed and, and um, the, you know, we looked at them before they went in, the county looked at them, Howard Hughes looked at them, and to do something simple um, that's up to date. Because I really am afraid um, if we do something too heavy, it's going to be create too much massing, is the term that architects use, but it's going to be too strong. We want a band shell that kind of blends in, is, is not that strong, and it has a kind of common design theme that we carry through, thinking that we have this, this thing for five to ten years. This is not a long-term solution. And the other idea, we're going to start replacing some of the railings around the fountain. And um, I don't know if you can, you probably can't picture in your mind, but the railing system they use at Bailey Park is a little simpler and not as ornate as what we have. The railing around the fountain has to come out. The pickets are spaced too far apart. By the time I take the railing out, put new pickets in, and fix it, um, I'm going to spend a lot more money than I would if I just take that design, which I think is it's simple and, and current in Bailey Park, and move that design over to where we are now. And, the, and we're not touching the lights. The, the lights, that's a, it's a million-dollar project, and I agree. Well, okay, we're touching the lights. I'm in the process of replacing the metal halides of Jer thank Jeremy, with LEDs. And that is um, in process. We've already done five or ten. We're trying to find the exact right glow that everybody likes. Um, but so we're not, those lights are not changing. Thanks, Dennis. Jess? Oh, I'm for a minute. I forgot what I was going to ask. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I was taking notes on what Dennis said. Um, I want to make sure that we don't lose sight of the Columbia Festival of the Arts request. Is that something that would be best discussed in our next work session? Or, how, I mean, I know we have the same issue where there are trade-offs and we'd have to figure out how to make that happen. But, um, you know, I do believe that if we're going to be funding one organization, we should give them a fair shot at it. So. Um, what is, I guess I'm really asking staff, or maybe I'm asking you, Janet, like what the best process is for making sure we look at that. I'm open to suggestions on that one. Uh, so, Susan, I'm going to ask you to also weigh in on this, but we had talked internally, not about any specific requests, but just how this timeline would work. Um, because we, uh, you know, our next meeting is on February 10th, and that's the last meeting before uh, February 24th, which is the vote. And um, the reality is between the 10th and the 24th, we as staff really only have one week because we post, mm -hmm. you know, a week ahead of the meeting. Um, so we were really hoping that out of this meeting, if there was going to be 
Uh, we were hoping for more clarifying questions and not changes, but if there are going to be changes, I do think, um, and Susan again, weigh in on this. I think where we landed is, is we really have to have a pretty strong sense of board direction on that, where we're not coming back on the 10th and then saying, okay, what about this? again right so so if the idea has come up tonight and if the board can it, you know whether it's a formal um decision i think at least getting a majority sense that you want us to move in this direction so again on the six pence tot lot um you know if you wanted to bring this idea in or if anything that would actually change funding um because we've had a lot of those clarifying questions, which is more what we expected. But if there's a change funding, I, I think we really have to have um, direction, if not a final decision, at least direction tonight. Susan, would you agree with that? Yes, and, and it does, you know, we, as Lakey pointed out, there's a meeting in two weeks, which means really we have about a week to, to turn that around so the community can see it. So be important. Okay. so. So then I would like to sort of propose to the board, I don't know if I want to call it a motion or just a, you know, a suggestion. I would really like for staff to come back at the February 10th meeting with an option for how we could give funding to the Festival of the Arts and how we could prioritize six pence. If there's a way to, you know, move money around in the capital budget to to make it possible for the six pence renovation to be prioritized, whether that's in the category two or in the category one. And then if, um, you know, what, what options we might have for, you know, for potentially funding the Festival of the Arts. Um, let's get, Je Jess, if it's okay with you, do you mind if we get through the rest of the comments and come back to what you've just suggested and we'll do a pulse? Generally? Not at all. Not at all. Okay. Uh, so I was up next. Um, I don't want to open a Pandora's box, but I um, I can appreciate if Hickory Ridge gave 70 grand back, it being reinvested in the community. And I, I know we have a policy around that. So I would like to just ask, um, if that's something that would be feasible or if that's creates too much complexity. So I might be able to uh, share a little bit, of, shed a little bit of light on that. So that policy um, was the, the board's, that's the, that was a board policy. That was a board directive to mm -hmm. um, uh, di direct that those funds will be used for environmental projects. So uh, that um, really would be up to the board, I think, to make that exception. If that and, and I will provide a reminder that in that discussion, this idea uh, of how it landed, or at least my recollection of the discussion, was that it landed on the idea of environmental and sustainability projects because the idea of being able to take that fund and invest more in, you know, say a facility or a tot lot could create um, an inequitable situation between villages. That was a point of discussion as well. So just as a reminder. Yes, thank you. Um, and my second question was a little bit more philosophical. I was just curious, I think I think I saw everything that we discussed in our last meeting. Was there anything that was that wasn't included that we covered in our December 9th? I'm just curious, like if there was anything that you cut that was like, oh, that hurts, you know, kind of. So, so uh, we accomplished everything that we were directed to do, mm -hmm. but uh, it the the minimum wage piece was a challenge. So the board, uh, kind of the, the direction that we got was to uh, use, uh, uh, try to offset that with uh, increases to the user fees for people who are predominantly benefiting from those, you know, because most of the, uh, the impact in the, in the, um, for minimum wage increases and compression is in community programs and services. So, you know, 
that, that would be where the outset. We couldn't do that. We couldn't get to that number um, with just the increases. So we did reduce um, some, uh, like I took out some um, teaching that I had in my budget and uh, operating um, expenses were reduced in uh, communications and marketing and in uh, and um, the other two big departments as well. So, so that, you know, that, but that was it. We, we did do, um, you know, what you directed. So in order to do the minimum wage and um, the Inner Arbor Trust grant, we, we had to make those other changes. So I want, wanted to be clear about that. But we did, we did everything that you directed us to do. Thank you. Uh, Ginny, you're up. Okay, a couple of a couple of quick uh, questions to follow up on what I think Andy was talking about um, about the lakefront. I thought his point was that it's important that the board be involved, and of course, then the public in terms of a public uh, uh, an open public process about what CA is planning on doing down at the lakefront. I thought that was part of what Andy was asking for. Or certainly, I'm asking for. So with the 500,000 before it starts getting spent, it, it's just a matter of you know, having a public meeting and saying this is what we're planning on doing. I would hope that would happen. The other thing is uh, I would actually want to guarantee that that would happen. Uh, the second thing is uh, in terms of easements, uh, I think the board needs to be assured that it will be the uh, vo voting on any easements at the lakefront area that anybody is asking for and also any existing easements with current retail, um, like say Clyde's or you know any, any retail in the area that we may have had some existing easements with, that that not be automatically uh, transferred to anybody else uh, moving into those retails, but that it come before the board. I would want those two guarantees in order, again, to have it in an open public process so that it is transparent and the public has a chance to uh, testify on it. In terms of uh, Columbia Festival of the Arts, um, we just heard this. It's very difficult for asking us to vote tonight when we're just hearing it and we're asking the staff to give us some idea of what that means in terms of cuts. And be, to be realistic about it, I think there was a request from uh, the village in Howard or they were planning on making requests. So you could have a lot more of those. Um, I guess I'd like to know in terms of the Festival of the Arts, um, whether there are any uh, costs to CA in terms of in-kind services that we've been providing. I think that was mentioned with another group where we said we're providing in-kind services. So if you could give us a figure on what does it cost us when we combine like December 17th with the downtown partnership for in-kind services? What does it cost us down at the lakefront uh, when we do the Festival of the Arts? What is the cost there for in-kind services? Okay, and, and if we could get that back. So I guess I'm saying I don't see how we vote on these things tonight. We're really just hearing them and we don't understand the ramifications, including uh, just the tot lot. We got to know what other tot lots would be cut. So. I understand that the staff may want us to vote tonight, but they've got to come back and tell us, if you do this, this is what will happen. And they're, I don't think, prepared to do that tonight. It's just reasonable. Well, okay. That, that's, it's fair. It's difficult when something comes in. Same yeah, way. you can't, you can't put, we're being pushed to vote. And I, I frankly don't think that's fair. So. Give us the information we need so that we can have an, a, you know, a, a realistic, intelligent vote of the, of the uh, what our options are. Thank you. Dick? Yeah, I uh, share Andy's concern about the lakefront. Um, you have to remember this was an architectural treasure. It won a lot of awards. This was a designed by Mort Hoppenfeld, who was one of Ralph's uh, original architects. It's a beautiful space, and I don't want to see it um, tarted up. You look at the uh, the park there, it's a beautiful park, but it's mostly playground. Uh, I don't know how that would that design would translate to our part of the, of the lakefront. Uh, I think the uh, concern that Dennis has about the railings, yes, that's something that could be, be looked into. But 
And there are things we need to do down there. That that carillon, that temporary carillon out on the dock is uh, got to find a new home. And uh, the uh, the last time we had a design firm come in here and give us some ideas, they were pretty scary. Yeah, so I, I think this is something definitely is going to need community involvement. I think maybe we want to get a board, you know, it'd have to be maybe just a small committee to work with Dennis on. Dick, I don't, I don't mean to interrupt you, but keep in mind that this is a short to midterm goal and not the permanent long-term plan for the waterfront. So well, I, just, I just want to call we that had, out. We had a short-term plan for the Carillon in, what was that, five, six years ago? Um, there are some things that can be done. Um, we do have a problem with the, uh, the, you know, the lack of a band shell there, but we have the tent that's out in the middle of the, of the walkway. And, you know, so there are some things that can be done, but this is not something to be done casually. And uh, I think it needs a lot of thought. Like I said, I think it needs community involvement and it definitely needs uh, not to be done on an ad hoc basis. Well, and as far as the, the $71,000 that Hickory Ridge kicked back, I don't have any problem with turning that from an environmental thing to a playground thing. To me, that's pretty much the same, the same sort of bucket. Well, Sherry? Um, yeah, and I just want to make a note that we're at 930. Um, uh, the CA has a grant policy, um, so if the board could see uh, that grants policy uh, prior to the next discussion, uh, since as Jenny said, this is the first time we're hearing um, this request and there will probably be other requests coming in. Thank you. Thank you. Susan? So I, I uh, just want to clarify that the vote on the budget is is scheduled for the for February twenty fourth, I think it is twenty. And uh, this is, so this is not asking for a vote. This is asking for direction that that needs to be uh, a general consensus of the board. So so we're not running down multiple scenarios over the next uh, three weeks when um, you know, there are there were lots of opportunities for this input earlier. So. It's um, and and because as I did express, it was a challenge to accommodate what is in here. So we just need some some pretty firm direction on uh, wh where you want us to go because we will not be able to run down multiple scenarios in this time frame, and that was supposed to have been done earlier. Yeah, thank you, Lynn. Yeah. Yeah, going back to the lakefront again, I thought some of that 500000 uh was supposed to be, or we talked about having it for planning, design, or is that a... Uh... What could be, we had one time talked about a major investment in the lakefront that would be a multi-million dollar investment. This is a lesser um, midterm investment and do something now. So right, which offer... makes... I'm sorry. Yeah, it makes total sense to do it that way. Um, you know, do we need do we need to have a design process? I know we're talking about public input and things like that, but again, in terms of, you know, are there areas you would prefer to look at first from what you've done and and who you work with? So, so I, I my thought was to focus on the band shell and the pavilion, and then if there's money left over from that, look at furnishings. You know, so maybe some tables or some mm -hmm. chairs. Um, and the fountain is in is in great shape. We you know we we, we have new lighting on the fountain, and um, the railing um, is would be funded out of um, the category three money, and that has to get done. That's that's like a safety issue. So it's the it's the band shell and the pavilion. So these are upgrades and repairs. Yes. Maintenance too. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, Eric, and then let's uh, revisit our other topics. 
I mean, yeah, I just have a general overall concern. So right now we have a uh, budget calls for a six hundred thousand dollar cash deficit. Um, so I'm a little worried about running a cash deficit, especially as we're increasing uh, staffing expenses. Um, so I'm worried that, and we're also getting more requests for uh, more funding for other things like uh, the Lake Fund festivals. So I'm a little worried that this cash deficit A is going to grow, and B is going to become structural and cause problems down the road. Thanks, sir. Uh, what I'd like to do now is just run down. So uh, I think uh, so. There are two two topics that Jess brought up. One is uh, six pence tot lot, and the other is funding for Columbia Festival of the Arts. Um, I'd like to just run through our roll call and um, have you give your sort of thumbs up, thumbs down, or Dick or Jess, do you have something specifically with related to what I'm talking about? Uh, yes, yeah. I think a question was raised about policy, and that's a good point. Uh, we are expecting a policy book soon. I was just going to check with Lakey to see if that's coming. Along. Okay, well, here, staff needs guidance if we're going to include these. I, I agree that it'd be, you know, useful to have what the policy is so that we understand, but I think we need to do a pulse check. If the majority of the board is not in favor, then we can worry about that later. If the majority of the board okay. is in favor, then we need to talk about it tonight. Uh, Jess, did you have something additional to that? Okay. Yes, yeah. I, I wanted to offer two proposals to kind of solve the, the problem. Um, one would be, I think that we could take, if we're looking at a five to 10 year solution at the lakefront, um, to me, I feel like an investment in a playground that's going to last over 25 years is a better use of some of that money. So my suggestion would be that we reduce that budget by whatever amount that it would take to to do the top lot, um, it, particularly if we could maybe, since I believe Dennis said that there's part of the money that's in the Category 2 budget, is intended for use on that top lot for the standard issue. So we're looking at $90,000 ish, $100,000. And considering we have a $100,000 de deficit, I think, and we have another organization asking for money, while I don't like to say this, I think we should hold off on giving anybody any money. Um, that way we can be consistent and we don't have to deal with other organizations coming out of the woodwork. Since our original intent was to not give any grants, I think we should stick with that, and that would get rid of the $100,000 deficit. Okay, I'm going to give everyone, you get 20 seconds to tell me your opinion, and we're going to take it from there. Uh, Andy. Um, okay, uh, on the tot lot. Um, I want to keep the capital budget at 11 million. I'm not willing to increase it. Um, I would consider, you know, a switching some money, um, but I think that's the only vote. So I don't really think, from the budget perspective, there would there wouldn't be a change in the overall budget for this. The, it's, it's just we're keeping it 11 million. As this just says, maybe you shift money left to right, but the for staff's direction, it's still an 11 million dollar capital budget. Um, in terms of the grants, um, I, it's just I think it's a little late at this point to try to, to shoehorn in um, the money um, because of how we the, the budget had to be built with the... Okay, you're you know, over your 20 seconds, Andy, yep, so wrap okay, it up, please. That's it. Okay. All right, Sherry? Yeah, I agree with Andy about keeping the um, capital budget at 11 million. Um, the only other possibility I see would be to. Um, so, are you saying you are in favor of shifting money from somewhere else? Or I would be. I would be reluctant. So what we need to know here is if you're willing to shift money from something else toward the tot lot, and whether or not you think. 
the I, I, quote. Yeah. I, I, I can say that I'm satisfied that that I think the staff has been right on in, in terms of 11 million for the capital budget. Um, So Sherry, I'm 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 sorry if I'm being dense here. I'm not clear on your stance on sixpence. I'm still not clear on what would be switched to where, and I think that's what the board has to work out. Okay, Jenny. Uh, yeah. Okay, I agree. Keeping it as uh, eleven million and. Um, I also feel that uh, without the information of knowing what we would lose, which village that maybe really needs something uh, would, would not have their tot lot or two villages wouldn't have it done. So I think we need that information. So based on that, I can't vote for spending more money right now on it until I know what it is. So the answer would be no on that. Okay, what about- At this time. Columbia Festival of the Arts. Uh, it's the same thing. We were lacking information on where it would come from, so I can't vote yes at this time. Okay. Dick? Uh, yes, uh, on uh, Festival of the Arts, I think they came to the, uh, came to the party a little too late. They should have been here months ago, like Inner Harbor was, and uh, we just can't make these shifts at the very last minute. As for the tot lot, uh, I thought the idea of taking that 71,000 that uh, uh, Hickory Ridge gave back and putting that in the tot lot budget uh, is, is a possible alternative. And again, I agree with Andy, uh, let's keep the capital budget at 11. Okay, Lynn? Uh, yeah, I agree with Andy. Um, again, keep the capital budget at 11. That I think that's pretty universal. Um, CFA is worthy, but again, it's it's just way too late. It, it upsets too many things. Um, does the annual charge refund that Hickory Ridge goes, is that money that's actually available? I mean, because if it is, that would be, I think, an ideal solution. But is it allocated other places in the budget? Susan does not. Yeah, so that is the the um, excess cash reserves. I don't know what that amount is, and I don't know if we can pull that up. Yeah, uh, right now. But then, just if if that's if it's seventy, I don't know. But it would be available to be used for. Um, so if we uh, gave them an exception on the environmental use, the board could do that. I'm sure we'll have other board uh, villages coming in and asking for some of the same things, but you know. That seems like a an easy trade. Um, can, okay. can I comment on that? We had this in Oakland Mills. I can tell you what happened. Can I comment quickly on it, it, Jen? How we had quickly exactly, can you comment? You have we 10 told, seconds. We were told no, we could not switch it onto other things or uh, it had to be on CA property, it had to be for environment and they've been working on it. They presented their proposals to the board. We were told no, we couldn't do anything, but what the board had approved. We just went through that cash reserves for Oakland Mills. That was. Okay, Susan? Well, that would be true, of course, because we would be implementing the policy. The policy. Right. So if that's not, I mean, it's, so for, you know, we were told it's because we're implementing your policy. I agree, I agree. I'm just saying we just went through it. A good example, we went through it and we, we cooperated, we, we agreed. Um, with you, uh, and John McCoy's done the work. Okay, we're you moving know. on. We're moving on. If you, I mean, if you'd like to revisit that with your village, that no, 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 I'm satisfied. Okay, I'm satisfied. Tina. Um, I am fine with keeping the capital budget at eleven, and we can play shuffle games later. I'm also fine with keeping the grant fund budget is, and we can play shuffle later with that. I think it's a false dichotomy that we are being forced to decide tonight. I don't think we have, I don't think we have, we have a combination of not enough information and too much information to make a decision tonight. And it's not necessary to make a decision tonight. We can keep the grant funding budget as it is and figure out to do with it later. 
Yes. I, I, do you need, I think I know yeah. how you stand. Do, do I need to add anything? Okay. Yeah. Uh, Eric? I do just. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I muted myself. Um, just to remind everyone that the six month hot lot has already been closed for two years. It's been closed since essentially the beginning of the pandemic. So I cannot imagine that there's another hot lot that would, you know, I do know they sometimes get shut down for a while, but we're talking a significant playground that's been closed for two years. Eric? I'm in general agreement of uh, everyone else. Um, I would suggest that we're gonna start making exceptions that maybe we should have a general policy to revisit how uh, those excess yeah. funds are allowed to be spent so that we're equitable across all the villages instead of trying to make exceptions all over the place. Ashley? I would support uh, shuffling things around for six pence to have the larger tot lot since it would last for 25 years with the $200,000 cost. Um, and then for the Columbia Festival of the Arts, um, it makes sense that they didn't come to us to request funds since we had stated that Columbia Association wasn't doing any grants. Um, so I would be open to funding at them out of the grant money that we've already set aside, the 125000 Like we could give them 25000 in, in Arbor Trust, trust 100000 um, and I'm only suggesting something like that because there are there's a very small list of unique organizations or nonprofits that work within Columbia. Um, I don't think there's a whole lot of nonprofits that applies to, uh, and I think those two fall within that list. Okay. Uh, and so I also agree, 11 million should not change. Uh, I I would be willing to revisit our policy on the village refunds. Um, just just confirmed that is 69,000. And uh, while I feel like um, Columbia Festival of the Arts is a worthwhile cause, I am concerned about trying to um, readjust the budget at this point, um, you know, unless we somehow magically come up with some money that we didn't know was there. So um, I struggle with that one. So I think based on the feedback, obviously 11 million stays the same. There is some interesting, uh, some interest in the possibility of shifting. Um, I mean, I'm gonna, again, I just, I express concern if we're cutting operational funds or, you know, if we're cutting things within the organization, um, it, it, you know, I'd like to understand what those trade-offs are if if we're looking at those. And I think it's important for this board to understand what those trade-offs are uh, because, you know, even though we might want things, um, that's part of the difficulty of budgeting, right, is not always being able to get everything. So, um, and then I think what I've heard is we do not plan on addressing the grant budget at this point. Uh, there seems to be some mixed feelings on whether those grants um, go to Inner Arbor Trust where they were originally allocated or somehow split those funds, but I did not hear an appetite for increasing the grant allocation. Does anyone disagree with that summary? Um, Okay, thank you everybody for your input. And I just want to state, I think that's exactly what we were looking for was the direction on 11 and there, I, I'm hearing loud and clear there's support for six pence. What we will return with prior to the next meeting is uh, a couple of options to demonstrate where the trade-offs could go to accommodate that request. So that is absolutely what we expected tonight, but just needed that are we actually exploring the option kind of as Susan indicated? So thank you for that feedback. Thank you. Okay, moving on, Human Resources Division update. Okay. And Monica, I'm very happy to hear that you're our DEI lead as well. So congratulations. On yes, you. thank you, thank you. So I actually was gonna um, just quickly set the stage that um, Everyone, as a reminder, you know, we're trying to cycle in these department updates so you have an idea, again, of what is going on inside of CA. And um, 
particularly for our internal facing departments, we heard from our, our key external facing community programs and services and community operations. Um, so, and Janet just took my other point, which was I just gonna highlight that again, uh, Monica has recently been elevated into the position of Director of Human Resources, Diversity and Inclusion. And as you already heard in our budget discussion, we're allocating resources. So very excited about that. Yes, thank you. All right, so um, for those of you that I've not had an opportunity to meet, um, Monica McMillan Ajayi, um, and tonight I'd like to provide you with an overview of uh, what's happening in uh, human resources here at CA. So I'm gonna share my screen with you and um, take you through an agenda and presentation, but I'd like to uh, just ask that we leave all questions until the end so that we can get through the materials. So uh, let me uh, present. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay. So we're going to do this as the uh, slideshow. All right. Okay, so the agenda that um, I'm going to take you through um, goes through DE&I, um, COVID-19, of course, everyone's favorite subject, um, learning and organizational development, and HR operations. All right, so um, diversity, equity, and inclusion is really consciously woven through um, everything that we do. And we're moving through that in a very intentional way. And um, for any of you, for any of you that know um, Lakey's passion, um, this is very important to her. And um, she has really made a commitment to this for our organization. And um, our workplace is really buzzing about this. Um, because they have been able to experience, you know, kind of this passion and, and, and leadership that Lakey has brought. And, um, you know, people are talking about it all the time, and we, we just have a buzz going here, and um, it's really appreciated. So to establish um, a firm foundation for our DE&I journey, um, we jump-started employee awareness and engagement on a really broad scale, um, by making sure that, um, you know, we had all full-time members go through a workshop about implicit bias and um, how to counteract those biases. And um, in, in true Lakey form, she was out in the community um, meeting individuals and got a connection um, through another connection with a local consulting group, Changing the Lens, and um, they came in and took us through what they've coined as an optics workshop. And this is the same workshop that um, the board members had gone through a couple of months ago. So all full-time team members went through it um, within the same time period, a two-week period of time, um, specifically so that um, we would all have a shared experience and no one would be left out. A survey was given at the end of the workshop to team members, and um, it was considered favorable by 94% of those that responded. And um, we were able to get some significant feedback um, from that survey. And um, team members had an opportunity to provide their overall feedback on many things that they wanted to see happen here um, internally. Um, and so they said they wanted to see more diversity at the higher levels within the organization. And um, we were able to um, accomplish that. Um, we had two SLT openings and we were able to um, attract and, and actually hire um, our general counsel and also our IT leader who um, are diverse candidates. And we're making a very conscious effort um, to look at all of our full-time openings and management positions as well um, with our eye towards making sure that we are seeking diverse qualified candidates within our candidate pool. Um, team members also said that um, we needed more diversity in our marketing materials. And so the marketing and communication department um, created an amazing marketing campaign um, that is on our website and social media. Um, and you can really see the diversity in that CA is for everybody campaign. 
Um, they've also done a great job in the marketing department um, with our recruitment ads. And so you'll see that um, some of our team members are showcased in the ad. And um, we clearly talk about in that ad that, you know, there's a, a real place for people here and it's not just the job. Team members also wanted um, more opportunities to um, interact with upper management. And in Lakey fashion, she was already planning and doing that um, before we even got the survey results. And um, it's just been wonderful because people have uh, been engaged and they've had an opportunity to um, have these quarterly meetings with Lakey and just ask questions, just talk freely. And um, we record those sessions so that people who could not attend get to see how that interaction happens. And our hope is that they're uh, inspired to participate um, in the next meeting. Um, team members um, also said that they wanted more communication um, just in general. And so we, we reinvigorated and deployed um, a newsletter we used to put out about all things CA called In the Know. And that's getting some great um, feedback. We've also increased um, all team member announcements. Um, and so there's a lot of information going out to employees on a regular basis about DE&I and um, things that come out even from the health department um, on a weekly basis, just as a few examples. Um, and then lastly here, um, I've been working with the marketing and communications team as well as IT um, to look at different opportunities in a more tech way to kind of interact with our employees um, as opposed to just email. So we're looking at um, potentially um, moving to an internal social media platform and also um, text messaging with our team members. And so for those of you who may not have had an opportunity to see the ads that marketing and communications has put together, um, this is what is out there for um, you know, getting people to understand that our facilities and our offerings are for everybody. And um, this is also what our recruitment ads look like. Team members also told us that they wanted opportunities to interact across departments, which is something that we had not really been successful at in the past. And um, so now all departments are getting together to try to make this happening, to try to make this happen. And um, Dennis and his team um, actually uh, arranged a tree planting um, opportunity in the fall for people to join his team to plant trees here in the community. Um, when we did uh, pronouns awareness training for our team members, we offered up an informal virtual pop-in session. Um, and we did several of those sessions or had several of those sessions available um, just so people could come in and talk and ask questions. And then um, Dan's area hosted um, the holiday season gingerbread contest, which was just a blast. Everybody had a great time. And um, the community even got involved with some of the voting. So that, that was really cool. Um, other things that we've done is uh, we curated um, a list of MLK activities and our team members um, participated in some of them and sent us pictures. So that was a lot of fun. And uh, the DE&I committee has also presented to the, um, to the leadership team on a couple of occasions. And um, we're planning events and curating um, events as well. But the one that I really want to point out is um, that the DNI committee, DEI committee um, actually presented the idea to the senior leadership team around making Juneteenth a paid holiday for CA. And um, fortunately, um, that has happened. So everyone is extremely um, excited and really feeling that, wow, when we present something to, um, to Lakey and the SLT, um, and especially around DEI, um, it's listened to and actually acted on. So um, I, I'm really just, I, I can't express how happy I am about the fact that, you know, that's something that really came to fruition. And so now the next thing uh, we're going to talk about is everyone's favorite topic again, COVID-19. So um, obviously that had an incredible impact on the organization. And so we have made some moves to try to do everything we can to create um, a safe work environment for our employees. 
So effective um, December 5th, we did institute um, a COVID-19 uh, vaccine mandate. And I'm happy to say that 99% of our team members are vaccinated. Um, the one caveat I will throw in there is that the school age services team um, is not included in this number because they were already following um, the protocols for the school district. And we didn't want to disrupt that. So um, we just left them um, in their own category. Dr. Oaken, who is our medical advisor, um, has come in uh, virtually and hosted two sessions for our team members to keep them updated on uh, COVID-19. Um, as with everywhere else, we um, really enforce our team members wearing masks when indoors, and we continue to follow um, the CDC guidelines and the local and, the local and state guidelines. So from a learning and organizational development standpoint, we are really rocking and rolling there. Um, each year, team members are required to go through yearly compliance training. And um, the purpose of that training is to make sure that every team member understands and adheres to our compliance standards and our policies. And um, compliance is a top priority for Lakey. And um, she was watching this very, very closely. And so um, fortunately, we had some really enhanced reporting tools and we were able to provide managers um, with reports to help them keep track of, of where their employees were. And um, I'm happy to say that um, we were able to get at a 90% completion rate for compliance training. And that is a major success for this organization, especially when you think about um, all the different types of work schedules um, that our employees have. So that was a very, very impressive outcome. Um, the L&D team is very much involved in onboarding. Um, they are instrumental in supporting the entire organizational um, foundation as it relates to training when it comes to the start of employment. And, um, you know, they also give um, a complete overview of all of our facilities. Um, L&D is an instrumental uh, part of the um, DE&I efforts. Um, since this is an organizational-wide effort, um, they ensure that they're working closely with me um, to make sure we uh, have the capabilities and that everything aligns with, with our strategy from a training perspective. So this small and mighty L&D team is also um, involved in various special projects that I'm not going to you know, get into tonight but um, they have a lot of technical expertise and um, they uh, get involved with all kinds of projects around the organization. And lastly, um, that team is going through an RFP process for um, learning and development content. Next, I wanna talk about benefits and compensation. So I'm not gonna to spend too much time on this because um, in the previous presentations, you've already um, been informed that we have gone back to a 6% um, contribution for our 401k. Um, one thing that I will address here that um, has not been brought up is that um, the Lakey and the team and the SLT has really recognized um, the, the financial sacrifice that our team members um, have gone through um, as it relates to the, the tough decisions we had to make a couple years ago. So um, a, a huge process um, was established to look back at what people had lost and to come up with a way to um, try to pay team members back for that loss. And um, so we have gone through and done some of that already, and um, we expect to have all of that completed by the end of this fiscal year. Um, our W-2s um, are available for our team members very early, um, and it's because um, the HR team has done a great job with making sure that we got employees engaged and involved with um, using the self-service capacity of Dayforce to sign up for their W-2s electronically. And so this is a huge success because um, we're not mailing out W-2s as much as we uh, did in the past. And um, we've already talked about the minimum wage increases and compression adjustments, so um, I'm gonna go past that.
And then this is always a great thing, employee recognition. And, um, you know, I'm happy to say we have so many loyal and dedicated team members here at CA um, with years and years of service. And as you can see here, we are celebrating 86 employees with milestone years of service. And so um, we've done that um, organizational wide to, um, to celebrate team members. And there's been department celebrations, and um, it's just really been a treat to um, work with such dedicated people who have really, you know, dedicated a lot of their life um, to CA and the community. So um, we're happy to be able to, to celebrate them. Um, recruiting, um, we are putting lots of effort into recruiting. Um, we, over the holidays, did a recruiting job fair at the uh, Columbia Mall. We um, have three job fairs um, scheduled with the local high schools. And um, we also um, have partnered with Hammond High School and we have uh, special needs um, high school students volunteering at three of our clubs gaining work experience. And it's really been a treat for them and also um, the managers of the, of the clubs. So this is um, a relationship that we are very, very proud, um, very, very proud of. Um, we're also planning um, job fairs at the clubs, and um, we have some key openings um, within the organization, um, obviously lifeguards and um, school age services, um, looking to uh, do all we can to fill those jobs. And um, <clears throat> we also have um, some openings um, in the office of the president, the community, community engagement manager position, and also um, the special projects manager. And um, we're really making a concerted effort um, within our job ads to, um, you know, message to people that um, we want diverse candidates applying to this to these jobs and to um, enhance the diversity within our uh, organization. So I will stop there and open it up for questions. Thank you, Monica. That was a ton of amazing information. Um, you guys have been busy for sure. Uh, Dick, did you get your question answered, or did you have an additional one? Uh, I uh, I put it in the notes, and uh, yeah, it should be okay. there. And and Monica, that is quite a lot of stuff you got in your wheelbarrow there. That's <laughs> really amazing. I uh, Dick, did you see that Lakey responded in chat as well? Oh, I uh, haven't been back there. I've been oh, okay. in by yeah. one of our HR departments up to. Uh, so I see the um, the board used to be invited to attend milestone celebrations. So you know we've changed the format a lot from what it used to be. So we used to have that big party, right? Is that that what you're talking about, Sherry? Yep. And so we we're not doing that party anymore. So what we've done, um, which is a bit different. Very cost effective, um, but still has a really good impact. Um, what we've done is we've picked a week and we said that every team member has to be recognized within this particular week across the organization. And so we, um, so the HR department gets all the information to the managers, gets all the gifts to the managers, and then we tell them that you have to have, you know, a, a, a huge, meeting with your team to recognize these team members. And so it all happens at the same time. And then on the intranet, we have this fireworks display that goes off. Mm -hmm. And um, it actually scrolls through every employee's name and shows you know, their years of service. So that's how we do it now um, to make sure we're still celebrating, but to do it in a safe and, um, and cost-effective way. I, I think that's that's really neat. Um, I would just like to say this this is the type of thing that used to be a lot of fun for the board to be able to attend events and get to talk to employees that we would not ordinarily see. There was a lot of interaction. Maybe there's some way of um, doing something virtual uh, where at least we could add our congratulations and let people know that we're really very supportive of everything that they do. Um, we, we know we have some tremendous idea. staff here, and, um, you know, I, I, think, I think the board would really like to be able to participate in some way. 
So thank you. But, but that sounds wonderful. Thank you. Jess? Hi. Um, first of all, Monica, congrats on your new role. And everything that you're saying is awesome. I love all the stuff that is happening. Um, I did have one quick question. I, I heard you mention that there was a special needs student who was working to get volunteering to get work experience. Is there a reason why that person is not being paid? Yes. Or, so actually, okay. Um, this is a partnership with Hammond High School. And right now we have like 28 students from Hammond High School working across our three clubs. And Hammond High came to us and said, well, I, I've developed a bit of a relationship with them because we did hire a sure. student over the summertime that we did pay and, and worked for us. Um, and so they came to us and said, but you know, we have this group of students who um, really need some experience and um, through what we kind of give them in school, and if they could just get a volunteer opportunity, it would just help immensely for this program that we're running. And so that's why they're in this volunteer capacity. But Got I you. So it's in conjunction with this program at Hammond that they're getting the, okay. Yeah. All right, that makes but, sense. But I will say, Jess, that, um, you know, when I, talk to Tavia and I talk to Kevin on a regular basis about this program, they are excited about it. And they are recognizing that there are students that are part of this program who over time, if they gain just a bit more independence, that they are individuals that we could consider hiring. So the fact that our managers are thinking this way and wanting to really engage in this partnership in, in a real tangible way um, just is, is amazing for us here at CA. That's good news. Good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ashley? Yes. So I love getting updates like this, especially to know what it is that we're doing for our staff and how important it is, um, obviously, that we maintain great staff and they're our biggest advocates in dealing with the community. Um, so over the past year in dealing with the great resignation and there's a lot of employees, um, where, you know, are struggling to hire folks. Um, and it's hard for companies to meet the salary requirements that a lot of other companies, right, especially larger corporations are able to pay. And I realize Columbia Association's not able to pay what, you know, certain organizations may be able to. Um, so what some companies are doing, they're offering a four day work week, right? So I know that also is not feasible because we have such a unique employment structure, but are we considering anything like that with like a flexible work schedule? Because a lot of companies are reducing work hours, right? They're finding some way it's e either we're, we're compensating employees financially or with giving them their time back. That's, those are the two biggest benefits. So is that something we're considering? So I will say that we actually have have really shifted the way we work. So um, our team members have a very flexible work schedule as it relates to coming into the office. Um, so, you know, there is some level of having to be there to support the community, obviously, and support our team members who are out there working in the community. So we've struck a balance where we've said, even though, um, we believe that if our team members in open space are here five days a week in the office, well, not in the office, but out in the community, you know, shouldn't we be here five days a week, you know, in the office supporting them? So we've, we've worked through how to make sure there is coverage in these office positions on a regular basis while still maintaining the flexibility um, to allow for remote work. So that's one of the things that we've done um, to accommodate um, flexibility. Um, as it relates to, to pay, yes, we're always looking at, you know, what can we do, but we offer such a robust benefit structure here, even for people who are not eligible for medical benefits. I mean, the list, it, there is a laundry list um, of what our part-time employees who only work one day a week um, get from CA. So um, we're always touting, you know, the fact that, hey, if you come here and, and work at CA, you, you get to work out for free. Um, you have free access to EAP services. Um, um, I mean, the list, the, the laundry list is just 
incredible. And, and we're very proud to be able to offer what a lot of organizations don't. Oh, great. So part-time and like seasonal employees, do they get access to medical and um, membership? Well, not medical, but definitely the membership. And they also get access to our EAP services and, um, and some other um, opportunities around vitality. And um, vitality is, is a benefits offering um, that really gives you prizes for wellness. So even if you don't have benefits, um, you can um, get these prizes for different wellness things that you're doing. So um, it's, we, we just you know, do everything we can to try to make our offerings attractive. Awesome, thank you. Mm -hmm. Tina? Hello, thank you so much for the information that you provided. You had mentioned very, very quickly a pronoun awareness training yes. that you offered the staff. I'm wondering if that could also, I don't know how long it was, but if it could also, if, um, if we could have that training as well. Sure. Thanks. So this was actually put on by our DE&I committee. Um, they did, the, they did the, the awareness training. And um, they curated um, some really interesting information um, around that. And, um, you know, it was fun. It wasn't too heavy, um, but it really gave people um, an opportunity um, to, to understand it. And I will say that what we did first was we made it mandatory for the managers. We said, you know, team members, if you want to participate in learning about this, that's fine. But every manager within this organization um, th this is mandatory for you. And um, so, you know, that's just the direction we're going in, making sure that our managers are, are ready and prepared um, for a diverse and inclusive workplace on every level. Thank you. All right, we are out of time, but does anyone have any last pressing questions for Monica? Okay, thank right. you so much, thank Monica. You. Okay, we are on to questions only, and you already answered my question, which was, uh, Lakey had mentioned the years of service recognition, and I was curious how they got recognized, so it was nice to hear about that. Um, does anybody else have any questions from Section 8? Andy. Uh, yes, uh, one of my questions concerns um, the, uh, the Howard County Council Bill to recall of employees. Um, and I'm very interesting that, you know, is that going to affect CA um, and, and what kind of effect it would have? I mean, because part of my concern is we've changed the organization since between pre-COVID versus um, now. Um, and so, you know, if we suddenly have to recall certain employees that we don't really have any place for them anymore. So I was just concerned about the impact. And so if um, we could get an update it's at some point from our general counsel on, you know, what do you see as the impact on CA? Yes. Andy, I didn't get the follow-up. Yes. Okay. And then the other thing I would say um, is um, thanks to Lakey and um, the staff who put together the climate vulnerability um, study last night. Um, Lakey did a good job, Jeremy did a good job, um, Tim good, did a good job, and the consultants. So, um, and they kept time, too. That's amazing. <laughs> Thank you very much. Was, was that recorded? Yes. Yes, it was. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And oh, Sorry, go ahead. Oh, you're muted. Lakey, you, you just muted yourself. Oh, sorry. I was so excited. Uh, this talking <laughs> app is live online. And it is like the best tool ever. It's a great indicator of where we intend to head with GIS and a lot of our capability. Um, it's a good little bite-sized piece. So thank you, Andy. Jess? Yeah, I had two quick uh, well, comment and a question. On the legislation, the Bill 93, Jen Tarasa's bill, it says that, you know, it doesn't directly affect the CA board, but it does because the, the CA board members have to run through their village. 
So um, we would be subject to the same rules that whatever is going to happen to the village board, um, you know, that is going to be, as, as I understand it, because that's who controls the election, we will be impacted by that. So I would love to see, um, you know, if there's, I don't know what the answer is, but I just wanted to sort of clarify that. And then the second question I had is on the Inner Arbor Trust report. Um, has there been any word as to when we might get the FY19 and FY20 audited financials? I don't know if Lynn or Sherry can answer that or if you've heard anything, Lakey. Susan, do you want to um, share what we have from the staff side? I mean, at least, uh, Susan well, can handle no, it. No, I haven't. I don't have an update from that. I had um, uh, re requested the, those three years, and um, 21 and 20 were still being worked on and are supposed to be delivered next month. Was the first, so I assume that's February, and then there was no response on FY19. Okay, why do Lynn have an answer since she just put her hand up? Okay. From what I from what I understand, they are still being worked on. Uh, there's been COVID. The auditors have been busy. Uh, the 2019 again. I the audit is being prepared. It there was no money. There was no anything in 2020. So that's all being worked on now. And, okay, but you, know, you don't know when it'll be done? Um, I have no idea. It's been at the auditors, actually for quite a while, the auditors are backed up and slow and, you know, I don't know. I've heard February, and that's all I know. Okay. But Thank we you. are trying, believe me. Okay. Good evening, all. Um, Thank you all for being here this evening for our webinar, Extension the Findings of CA's Recently Completed Climate Vulnerability Assessment. Sorry, I think that must have started. Yeah, sure that is, that is, somebody start playing. That is exactly Sorry, what I heard last night. <laughs> I opened the tab so I didn't lose the link, and I, it must have started playing. Apologies. All right. Um, any proposed new topics? Just. Yeah, um, I would like to, I know we, we've mentioned it a few times, um, revisit the grant policy um, or at least have a discussion or an educational piece for those of us who are newer to the board. Um, so that I would like to have that place sometime on the agenda, but I guess before the beginning of the next fiscal year so we can review that and you know, see if it needs to be further updated. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Tina? Tina, can you hear me? Okay, you are muted. Oh, there you go. Well, we still can't hear you, though. Uh, why don't we go to Dick and we'll come back to you, okay? Well, hi. Yeah, yeah uh, a couple of things. Uh, first of all, uh, I mentioned this earlier. We, uh, Lakey, you were working on a policy book. We were waiting until Wes uh, got here, and he's here. And uh, it's obvious uh, from our conversations that we really need to get that Bible of uh, policy uh, because we're kind of winging it right now. Uh, so I want to make sure that doesn't fall off the to-do list. Uh, the other thing is uh, ethics policy. Uh, I want to make sure that stays in in the queue because that was uh, in uh, Lakey's president report that Wes is working on that. Okay, good. I'm sorry, I, I, I did not I did not catch that. And uh, one thing that I thought would be helpful: uh, you're, you're hiring some new people uh, to take Janet's uh, take over some of Janet's duties. Uh, I'd really like to see the job description so we have an idea of who's doing what. So if those are available, it'd be nice if you could share them with the board. 
Uh, I mean, they're, they're open postings on our website. Um, I guess I can look into figuring out how to send you that link. Oh, okay, that'd be fine. Exactly. I mean, they're, they're posted, they're open positions, as I indicated. Okay, well, I'll just look under open positions. Okay. Thank you. Yep, yep. sure. Thank you. Tina, you're off mute. Thank you. I, um, I had said it earlier, but the um, training, if we can add that to the list. Uh-huh, okay. Thank you. Okay. We are um, almost to 10.30. Yep, I'm wrapping up right here, but thank you. And thank you, Sherry, for your timekeeping tonight. Um, Three minutes, I yeah. thought tonight, yeah, hey, I can keep it to less than that. I thought uh, we had a great budget discussion tonight, so thank you, everyone, and thank you, Susan, Lynn, and everyone on the staff that contributed to um, putting that together. It was, you know, I know a ton of work that started last year, so early in last year, um, you know, and with all of the sort of craziness around COVID and everything that that has done to impact it. Just keep in mind, everyone, that two weeks from now, we'll have our next discussion, and four weeks from now is our vote on this. So if you have anything that you all of a sudden, like, wake up in the middle of the night screaming about tonight, uh, make sure you get it to, every, you know, to staff and board so that everyone's aware, um, you know, within a week, because that is really, like, if you, if you hope to have it seriously considered, um, you know, kind of tonight's your last chance, but you know, if something's keeping you up, maybe there might be some wiggle room. Um, thank you to Monica for your human resources. I thought that was a lot of great information and, um, you know, very enlightening in terms of all the stuff that's going on. I was amazed at how much it was. Um, and also thank you to Pat O'Malley for the, um, you know, commitment to working with the um, policy and the vendors and, you know, trying to make this, um, a robust policy that reflects, um, you know, what CA stands for. Um, okay, so I think we won't know yet until next month whether or not um, we'll be hybrid, back to hybrid or in, uh, or completely virtual. So I will keep you posted, but our next meeting is February 10th. Um, and we'll be getting an update from Armsby Carbon, who is our new IT director. Um, and yeah, I think that's it. So may I have a motion to adjourn? I'll do that. Dick moves. Second. Second. Jenny seconds. Any objections? All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Good night. Good night.